And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. This part of human nature recognizes that a man's security and happiness depend on working society. Not only has applied science decreased the toil in the home, but it has provided undreamed of economic opportunities for women. Now, got the phone? I thought it was the good humor man who came. <laughs> We must have concrete, tangible action that will remove the inequities in our society. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. As Americans, we can take pride in the care and quality inherent in the design and production of stamps by our Postal Service. Very often, we affix a stamp to a letter and never give a thought to its meaning. Yet stamps are a good indication of a nation's scope, heritage, and direction. Cowboys and Indians. Soldiers and scholars. Inventions and discoveries all have been the subjects of memorable stamp issues. By recognizing significant events of historical and cultural importance, postage stamps support one of America's most popular hobbies, stamp collecting. No wonder there is an enthusiastic market for our stamps. They are ours. And you are a valued member of the organization that makes them available to collectors everywhere. Today, there are more than 19 million stamp collectors in the United States alone. These collectors are known as philatelists. Philately is a $10 word, and you may find employees in the service who do not know its meaning. One window clerk was heard to say, facetiously we hope, that stamp collectors become philatelists only at about age 21. Philately is a Greek word, philos meaning love. For example, the love of stamps. And Adelaia, meaning tax exemption, which is a reference to the postage stamp's special function, rendering a letter tax-free to its recipient. This was not always true. In the early 19th century, for instance, the receiver of mail paid the tax. Picture the problems encountered by the letter carrier of that day, a money transaction for each and every delivery. Imagine the chaos this would generate today, paying for the mail you wanted and rejecting the rest. Fortunately, you are there, a link between the United States Postal Service and the American public, selling stamps for postage and for collection. You represent quite a history. In 1837, Sir Roland Hill, a former school teacher, brought order to the British system when he proposed the idea of printed adhesive-backed coupons to be sold in advance to letter senders. This concept led to the production of the world's first postage stamp, the Penny Black, issued on May 6, 1840, with its distinctive profile of the young Queen Victoria. In 1842, a regional issue of adhesive postage stamps went on sale in New York City. The experiment proved to be successful. And in 1845, an act of Congress authorized the use of adhesive-backed postage stamps throughout the United States, although it was 1847 before the first United States postage stamps were printed. Here we see those first United States stamps, the five-cent Franklin, and the 10 cent Washington. As you see, there were no perforations, as this technique for separation was not developed until some five years later. The first US pictorials were issued in 1869 and were the forerunners of modern commemoratives. Here, we see examples of the Columbian Exposition issue of 1893. 
In addition to the regular or definitive issues, as collectors prefer to call them, and commemorative stamps, today the Postal Service also produces booklets, which can be commemorative, special, or definitive stamps, coils, and postal stationery, all items of great interest to the collector. Stamp collecting is an inexpensive hobby and can be lots of fun. It has become increasingly popular among children as a result of several Postal Service sponsored school programs. The Postal Service helped organize and communicates with thousands of Benjamin Franklin stamp clubs in the third through seventh grades in schools throughout the country. The establishment of new clubs is an ongoing activity and is designed to introduce the fun of stamp collecting to youngsters and to sustain their interest in the hobby. The Postal Service provides teachers and students with a complete club organization package, including posters, membership cards, films, and a monthly newsletter. From these materials, students are introduced to the educational values of stamp collecting. For information about how to start a Benjamin Franklin Stamp Club, consult your local postmaster, the MSC Stamp Club Coordinator, or write to the National Program Office, Benjamin Franklin Stamp Club Program, Washington, D.C., 20265-9994. Research studies show that a large percentage of today's adult stamp collectors began collecting at a very early age. Through the stamp clubs, the Postal Service can expand the number of future collectors. Naturally, there are varying levels of sophistication associated with stamp collecting. These range from those who collect canceled stamps taken from letters, to the more advanced collector who builds his collection around specific countries, types of stamps, special stamp configurations, stamps issued within a given era, or subjects on a single topic, such as trains, butterflies, paintings, or flowers, to name but a few. These are called topicals. Some collectors even specialize in postal stationery and cancellations. As is the case when any new subject is undertaken, it makes sense to start with the basics. Therefore, if we are to discuss philately, we should start with the five types of stamps issued by the U.S. Postal Service. First, regular or definitive stamps. They are stamps specifically issued for ordinary postal needs and placed on sale for an unlimited period. New definitives are issued when postage rates change or a new series is introduced. Second, there are also special purpose stamps issued for a specific purpose, as for example, for express mail or for international airmail letters. They are printed for an unlimited period and are only replaced because of a rate change. Third, there are commemorative stamps, which are issued in observance of an historical event. Noted Americans. It is interesting to note that a person must be dead at least 10 years, except U.S. presidents, to appear on a commemorative stamp. And topics of national importance. They are sold for a limited time. Fourth, memorial stamps are issued to honor presidents on a birth date, normally one year after their death. And fifth, special stamps, usually issued for a special occasion and printed in large quantities, such as Christmas stamps. You will find that most collectors refer to memorial and special stamps and certain regular issues, such as the love stamp, as commemoratives because they are similar in appearance to commemoratives. Panes of stamps are always printed in the same overall size. 
However, the number of stamps in the pane will vary, depending on the size of the individual stamp. Most of the stamps that you sell for postage use on letters will be regular or definitive stamps. They are the backbone of our sales. On the other hand, most collectors will want commemoratives and other customers will request some pretty stamps to use on their letters. Commemorative stamp issues are usually printed in sheets of 200 and quartered into panes, which are what you receive at the counter of 50 stamps each. Depending on the size of the individual commemorative stamp, you may have panes of 32 jumbos, 40 semi-jumbos, 48 square stamps, or 50 standard size stamps. Each of these may also be considered either vertical or horizontal in format. Regular or definitive stamp issues are normally printed in sheets of 400 stamps and are quartered into panes of 100 stamps each. The Postal Service has tested the mini size regular issue having 150 stamps per pane. There are eight key characteristics associated with most stamps of which you should be aware. You will encounter collectors who will demonstrate interest in one or even all of them. We will be using the Delaware Statehood issue to demonstrate. The vignette, meaning the central subject of the stamp. In this stamp, it is the state's official seal the frame, the part of the stamp surrounding the vignette, similar to a picture frame. The issuing country. Except for Great Britain, which was first with postage stamps, all countries put their names on their stamps. Ours is normally U.S. or U.S.A., although United States is sometimes used. The denomination, expressed in dollars or cents, must be on all stamps used for international mail. Non-denominated issues, such as the D stamp, used during periods of rate increases, can only be used for domestic mail. No value appeared on the issue, only a letter. That letter equals the new rate for a one ounce first class letter. The 1981 Christmas issues are also an example of non-denominated stamps that can be used only for domestic mail. Envelopes and postal cards may also be non-denominated. The borderline, the outermost writing on the stamp. Philatelists have a name for everything. The margin, the exposed paper stock outside the printed border. Philatelists look for equal or even margins, meaning a well-centered stamp. The perforation the tiny punched out holes between individual stamps to facilitate separation. Perforation is expressed as a number, meaning the number of holes every two centimeters. An identical stamp issue may have two different perforation values. To a stamp collector, these are two different stamps. The perforation is always measured across the horizontal first and the vertical second. And the tooth is the point between each perforation when the stamp is separated. Philatelists take pride in their hobby, and they represent an important source of revenue to the Postal Service. Just think for a moment. Each mint stamp saved by a collector may be counted as a profit of nearly 100%. As a window clerk, you are the primary contact for these customers. It is therefore important that you understand the basics of philately and the importance of effective merchandising and selling. The purpose of this program is to increase your knowledge of philately and of the existing line of philatelic products. To give you a better idea of how to effectively merchandise and sell philatelic products. To make your daily work more interesting because you will understand some of the particular needs and interests of your stamp collectors. To make your work personally more rewarding and varied. To help you assist your customers in an effective and efficient manner. And to help you become a more effective philatelic salesperson 
with the potential of selling more stamps to more customers. You're selling more than a stamp. You're selling the hobby of a lifetime. It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. So this is for my mother and father in Spanish. En el día más grande de mi vida, para los nenes de la bendición mía y que mis padres me echen mi bendición en Puerto Rico. Nobody ever creates a category for themselves, actually. Um, and other people make categories to, so they know where to find you. He put his hand over my arm with a strong grasp, and he said, Francis, I'll tell you something. You keep still about it. The war will be over in May. I think when the owners really see beyond the end of the noses, they're going to start using ball players who have saved them and their game because had it not been for the Negro ball players the last 20 years, I don't know where baseball will be. Contact your local police or sheriff's department to learn how to help a take a bite out of crime. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. No matter how it moves, by surface or by air, registered mail is a premium service for firms and individual U.S. Postal Service customers everywhere. It's the safest, surest way to move an envelope or package, large or small, across the country or overseas. How safe? Well, banks use it to mail cash. Jewelers and museums ship precious gems and irreplaceable objects. Individual shipments, some worth millions of dollars, cross the country every year registered articles that must reach their destinations. The United States Treasury uses registered mail to ship currency around the country. When Harry Winston made a gift to the Smithsonian Institution in 1958, he shipped a small box wrapped in brown paper from New York to Washington by registered mail. In the box was the world-famous Hope Diamond, valued at that time at $1 million. It's the safest way to ship gems, he explained, I've sent gems all over the world that way. Not many registered items are as famous or valuable, but all registered mail moves under the same controls. When you complete this program, you'll have a basic understanding of the registered mail system, an increased awareness of your responsibility for handling registered mail, and familiarity with national registered mail policies and procedures. In addition to this videotape, the training program includes six units and separate workbooks covering all aspects of registered mail service. These workbooks make it possible to tailor training to individuals assigned to various registered mail duties. All formal training is supplemented by on-the-job training. You are an important part of the system. The Postal Service is only as good as the people who make the system go. Trained, skilled people who have earned the responsibilities that go with their jobs. Nowhere is individual performance more important than in registered mail operations. Therefore, it's important to follow instructions and guidelines for processing registered mail contained in the Domestic Mail Manual and Registered Mail Handbook. This program is based on the procedures outlined in these documents. 
Unlike any other U.S. mail, even express mail, registered mail moves from point of acceptance to point of delivery by way of a tracking system of signed receipts. To ensure the integrity of the system, postmasters and other postal employees are responsible for the safe and proper handling of registered articles. Registered mail service is available at all post offices, stations, branches, and from rural carriers. To be acceptable for registration, an article must be mailed at the first class or priority rate. Other classes of mail can be requested for international mail. The article must bear the complete names and addresses of both sender and addressee, and must be securely sealed in accordance with postal regulations. Articles not accepted for registration include those whose face is less than three and a half by five inches, less than three and a half by five and a half for international mail, business reply envelopes, some window envelopes, and padded envelopes, except for international registered mail. For additional fees, other services are available with registered mail. COD service to domestic destinations, return receipts, restricted delivery, and registered mail insurance up to $25,000. Liability is limited for international registered mail. The value, but not the nature of the contents, must be declared by the sender. If the registered item is considered more valuable than $25,000, the customer is advised to buy commercial insurance to cover the difference. The contents of letters and packages usually registered by postal customers include negotiable instruments, such as stock certificates payable to the bearer, non-negotiable instruments, such as bonds, checks, wills, and similar documents, merchandise, and non-valuables, such as letters and files. In most cases, the registration process begins when a customer presents a properly sealed and addressed article to a postal clerk at a retail window. The customer should have already filled out the bottom section of the mailing receipt. The clerk determines that the article is acceptable, computes the amount of postage and fees due using the top portion of the mailing receipt, collects the fees from the customer, and signs the mailing receipt. The clerk then fixes label 200 to the article and enters R and the nine-digit registration number on the mailing receipt. After postmarking both copies of the mailing receipt, he issues the original copy to the customer. The transaction is complete when the clerk endorses the article for any additional service requested, postmarks the article on the back, affixes postage, and secures the registered article in a locked drawer or cabinet. The first step in the journey takes place when the article is transferred to the next accountable person, in this situation a clerk from the registry unit, who periodically picks up registered mail from the window clerks. The window clerk has previously listed the registered articles on a manifold bill, Form 3854, prepared in duplicate. This is the most frequently used form in the registered mail system. Here, it is being used as the receipt in a hand-to-hand -hand exchange, the prescribed procedure when registered mail is exchanged directly between postal units. The receiving clerk checks the registered articles against the entries on the bill, and if they agree, signs the bill and keeps a copy. After the exchange, the receiving clerk is fully responsible for the handling and safety of the registered articles. At large postal facilities, specially constructed containers may be used to safeguard the mail. The registry clerk places the articles and the bill into the container and secures it with a rotary lock for transit to the registry unit. Rotary locks are standard items used to identify and secure most containers in surface dispatches of registered mail. The lock has a fixed number engraved in the metal and a window containing a number that advances one digit each time the lock is opened. Numbered tin band seals are used instead of rotary locks when registered mail is dispatched to offices or units without rotary keys and when registry shipments are dispatched by air. The registry unit, center of all registered mail activities in a postal facility, is usually enclosed by a wire screen partition, so it's also called the registry cage. To ensure security, the registry cage is locked at all times and a record of all employees and visitors who enter is kept by the responsible supervisor. A registry unit is usually divided into work areas for receiving and opening, 
distributing, dispatching, record keeping where registry records are processed and retained for a two year period, and in large postal facilities, an area where valuable articles are retained until dispatch. Smaller offices will retain valuables in safes or other secure areas. The primary function of the receiving and opening area is to verify incoming dispatches of registered mail. The registry clerk, who earlier picked up registered mail from the window clerks, opens the container, removes the articles, and sorts them to primary separations. If any valuable articles are identified, they are transferred to the valuable unit clerk. The only time a hand-to-hand -hand receipt is required inside the registry cage. Local management determines the minimum value for articles to be declared as valuable pieces and transferred to the valuable unit, but never less than $1,000. Registered mail may be enclosed in a variety of containers. Registry envelope containers, used to dispatch small amounts of registered letter mail or other small items. Nylon pouches, for pouchable registered mail dispatched by air. Canvas pouches, used for pouchable surface registered mail. Concon containers. And hampers with security liners for transferring pouches and other registered articles by surface means between large postal facilities. If registered articles are too large or too heavy to be enclosed in containers, they are classified and dispatched as outsides, for obvious reasons. Aside from hand-to-hand -hand receipts, another means of accounting for registry dispatches is by mail dispatch receipt, used when registered mail is transferred from associate offices and other postal facilities by either surface or air dispatches. Generally, a three-part registry dispatch record, Form 3830A, is used. The dispatching office encloses two parts of the dispatch record in an EP-9 envelope attached to one of the pouches in the shipment. The EP-11 envelope is used for shipment of outsides. At the receiving and opening area, the condition of each pouch, container, or outside is examined. The particulars are checked against the entries on the dispatch bill. The registered articles are removed from the pouch and each is checked against the entries on the enclosed bill. If any irregularities or discrepancies are noted, the supervisor is notified immediately. These occur when there is a deficiency or difference in the number or type of entries on a dispatch bill and the pouches or outside articles received. Distribution at the receiving and opening area is normally limited to separations for local, air, and surface destinations. Further separations are made in the distribution work center where major tasks include transporting registered mail to the area in trays, carts, or other containers, and distributing letters, flats, and parcels to designated separations. Billing and pouching procedures for a registry dispatch usually begins at the distribution cases. When making a typical surface dispatch of pouchable registered mail, both inside and outside dispatch bills are prepared. First, the proper equipment is selected. In this case, canvas pouches the number and kinds of labels, tags, locks, and seals needed for the dispatch are determined and selected. And the inside dispatch bill is prepared. Offices with the Automated Dispatch System for Registered Mail, or ADSRM, are required to use this equipment for preparing this bill. Using the scanner, the equipment reads the article number from label 200 and prints it on form 3854A, an automated dispatch bill. Offices without ADSRM use Form 3854 to list the registered articles in the dispatch. A completed 3854A will show the lock and rotary number, the destination, time of dispatch, signature of clerk preparing the bill, and postmarks of originating office. The original bill is placed in the pouch with the registered articles and the duplicate copy will be sent to the record keeping section. The pouch is accounted for by listing on a registry dispatch record. Two parts of the dispatch record are placed in an EP9 envelope. The pouch is closed, the envelope attached to the hasp, and the pouch secured with a rotary lock is ready for dispatch. Coded shipments registry dispatches of unusually high value are always provided additional security. 
information concerning value and type of registers is restricted to postal employees on a need-to-know basis. During transit, coded shipments are given convoy service at all times outside the registry unit. An unarmed postal employee, an armed postal police officer, or both accompany the shipment. The training program includes specialized training for employees assigned to prepare or handle coded shipments. International registered mail, processed, billed, and dispatched the same as domestic mail, must meet most of the same requirements. It is routed by CONCON and surface dispatches to U.S. exchange offices for shipment overseas. Registered mail from other countries is also processed at an exchange office before it enters the domestic mail stream. One unit of the training program is devoted to international registered mail service for employees assigned to these duties. Procedures for preparing air or CONCON dispatches are similar to those for surface dispatches, except nylon pouches and CONCON containers are used instead of canvas pouches. CONCON tags and numbered tin band seals are used to identify and secure the nylon pouches. These red and blue containers, used only for air dispatches, are named for their use in the CONCON program. Dispatches are concentrated at designated airport mail facilities and convoyed to air carriers for shipment. CONCON labels, numbered tin band seals, and LA locks are used to identify and secure the CONCON containers. Employees assigned to prepare and handle CONCON dispatches also receive specialized training. To better understand what happens to registry shipments between postal facilities, we'll follow this dispatch in CONCON containers, sealed, tagged, and locked with EP9s attached. The seal numbers have been listed on Form 3854. After the transfer to an MVS driver, the registry clerk retains a copy of the receipt and gives the remaining copies to the driver. When the shipment arrives, another hand-to-hand -hand transfer is made between the MVS driver and a registry clerk. The registry operation at an airport mail facility, or AMF, is basically a transfer activity. The AMF registry clerk opens the container, verifies the CONCON containers, and sorts them for air dispatch to various destinations. When a dispatch is completely containerized and is not a coded shipment, convoy service is not required to plane side. Registered dispatches to associate offices, stations, and branches are transported by contract and MVS drivers to the office or unit of delivery where articles are receipted for and processed for delivery by a designated clerk. Registered articles are always kept secure and separate from regular mail. The designated clerk will assign the registered articles to the appropriate delivery person on the charge-out record. Registered articles are usually delivered by window clerks, special delivery messengers, or carriers. If the customer is unknown to him, the carrier must see identification before a registered article is delivered. The recipient may inspect the article as long as the carrier maintains possession of it. The same procedure applies when a customer claims a registered article from a window clerk. The customer signs for the article, thus ending the journey for one of the millions of pieces of registered mail handled each year by the Postal Service. This overview has introduced you to registered mail training for craft and supervisory employees. When you've completed selected units of the training program, based on your assignment, and the on-the-job training that follows, you'll be ready to take your place in the registered mail system of the U.S. Postal Service. Welcome to the team. Okay, thanks. Can I help the next person, please? Hi, how can I help you? I'd like to mail this, please. What on earth is... Oh, a Schlinger, huh? <laughs> That's the third one this week. Beverly Hills. Huh? How soon does it need to get there? I'd like it to be there by the end of the week. Well, we have priority mail that gets there be an average of two to three days. That's great. 
Uh, would you like me to explain the available special services to you, like delivery confirmation or insurance? No thanks, but thanks for asking. This has got to be one of the most unusual packages I've ever seen here. But it sure is light. Yes, it is. Uh, do you have anything in here that is uh, fragile or uh, potentially hazardous, liquid, perishable? No, it's a double-handled for Schlinger, a musical instrument played by two people. At the same time? Of course, it's the only way. I see. Let me weigh this. Okay, is there anything else I can do for you? Um, maybe you'd like a phone card? No, thanks. Your total will be $10.35. That's all? Yeah, that's the price of a four-pound priority mail parcel to Zone 8. Hmm. Is there something wrong? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, there is. What? You didn't apply the balloon rate for large, lightweight packages. You know, you're right. But how do you know about that? Because I'm the narrator, and uh, it's in the script. Okay. So tell me, if you know about the balloon rate, why didn't you assess my package? Well, I actually, I don't come across it often, so it's easy to forget, and it's also hard to explain to a customer. You know, sometimes they get upset over the extra cost, because they don't realize it costs us extra to transport. And then while I'm trying to explain all that, the line backs up, and I've got more upset customers. So you're concerned about how long it takes? Well, let's just say I don't want to slow down the line for any reason. Well, I understand the need for keeping the line moving. Customers want to get in and out, and you want to keep them satisfied. Exactly. Do you think it would help you to remember if you knew it was worth approximately $13 million every year in lost priority mail revenue? What? $13 million a year? Yes, and that doesn't even take into consideration what the Postal Service loses in parcel post revenue for the balloon rate. Here it is in black and white. How did you just happen to have this? I'm the narrator, and it's in the script. Don't you wish you could do this every time you had to make a point? Here's the fact. Every year, the Postal Service loses approximately this much in priority mail revenue alone. All because the balloon rate was not assessed. You're kidding. Not even slightly. See these? They represent priority mail parcels. There are 225 of them. A recent study showed that... about one out of every 225 priority mail parcels qualifies for the balloon rate. But out of all those priority mail parcels, only one out of every 900 is actually assessed the balloon rate. Just one parcel. Here's the bottom line. Out of every four priority mail parcels that qualify for the balloon rate, only one gets assessed. The other three, they're getting by, not a penny more, even though they qualified for the balloon rate. So this is what it all adds up to. Approximately $13 million every year lost on priority mail revenue alone. That's what we should be collecting from the balloon rate? That's right, but it's not just the balloon rate. There are other parcel rates, too, but first let's review. Balloon rate. That's for priority mail and parcel post packages with a combined length and girth between 84 and 108 inches and weighing less than 15 pounds. Now let's talk about the oversize rate. That's for parcel post packages only. They have to be over 108 inches, but less than 130 inches. And finally, we have the non-machinable surcharge for non-machinable parcel post packages only. But that's another video. All right, but they've been around for a while, and apparently I'm not the only one that's forgetting to collect them. So what's the big push now? Good question. The answer is cost, revenue assurance, and competition. Think of it this way. It costs us more to ship a lightweight, bulky parcel than it does a regular parcel. That means we're losing money. $13 million a year for priority mail. I'd say we're losing a lot of money. Right, and at the same time, the Postal Service has to find ways...
set to save $5 billion over the next several years. That will help us remain competitive. And when it comes to revenue, the more we can earn, the more secure our jobs are. Okay, every bit counts, but there's just one thing. What's that? I can't seem to find my tape measure. Oh, not a problem. Use mine. Man, you narrators sure come prepared. First, I measure the total length. Hey, 48 inches. Then I measure the girth at the widest point. At 13 plus 6 is 19 times the two sides. That becomes 38 inches. Plus the 48 inch length gives us a grand total of 86. Good. How do we assess the balloon rate? On my NCR system, after I enter the destination zip code, I just select the surcharge dyna key on the what are you mailing screen. That gives me the surcharge screen. And from here, I select the balloon priority dyna key and continue with the transaction. And on an IBM POS1 terminal, after entering the destination zip code, touch the surcharge button on the how quickly screen and follow the prompts. On the Unisys IRTs, after selecting a mail class key and entering the destination zip code, select the oversized surcharge key and choose from the list of rates on the menu. Manual offices can find the rates in the Notice 123 rate chart. Okay, that'll be $27.80. Perfect. Thank you. You should be able to do that all the time, whenever a parcel qualifies for the balloon rate. Boy, I can just imagine some of the complaints I'm going to receive. What? You want to assess my package an additional rate? You've never done that before. What is it, some kind of hidden fee? I'll take my package someplace else. <laughs> Jim, 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 just remind your customers that it's not something new. It's not a new rate. And if they want to go to one of our competitors, well, they apply balloon rates, too. They have a lot more surcharges in the Postal Service, and some of them are a lot higher, too. Well, that's true. Let me give you one last example. Measuring tape, please. Sure. Let's say you have a four-pound priority mail parcel. The length is 18 inches. The total girth is 64 inches. That's 16 plus 16 plus 16 plus 16. So the combined length and girth is 82 inches. That's under the minimum length and girth for the balloon rate. For priority mail to zone eight, the cost is $10.35. Now, add just one inch to each side 18 plus 17 times 4, now the combined length and girth is 86 inches. That qualifies for the balloon rate, and going to zone 8, that rate is $27.80. That's a difference of $17.45. That's the revenue we should be earning. That's what's fair. You're right. That is a big difference, especially when you consider all the parcels that just go through this post office. The same is true in every post office, all 38,000. It's time we started to collect the appropriate fees to cover our transportation costs for lightweight, bulky parcels. Sounds right to me. Uh, just one more thing, since you seem to have all the answers. What's that? If somebody needed a measuring tape, how would they purchase one? That's easy. Parcel measuring tapes can be purchased from the Postal Products Catalog on eBuy. Item number 65873, model number N1025156. And if your office is not on eBuy, you can call 800-229-4500 or fax your order to 800-570-0007. So, a double-handled for Schlinger, huh? Well, this is definitely a first for me. I hope it will not be your last balloon rate assessment. Well, I'll do my part. Consider this my contribution to the annual $13 million priority mail revenue opportunity. Hey, it's a little wordy, but I like the concept. Thanks, and thank you for choosing the Postal Service for your mailing needs. You're very welcome. Can I help the next person in line, please? How can I help you?
way that I can find out when that will get there? As a matter of fact, there is. Our customers have been asking for it, and now we have it. Delivery confirmation. Oh, great. An efficient and inexpensive way for our customers to know when their mail was delivered. Just one more way the Postal Service is using technology to offer better service to our customers. The process is simple. When a customer chooses delivery confirmation, a special barcoded label is attached to his or her priority mail or standard mail B. The customer keeps part of the label as a receipt and for delivery information lookup. The label on the package helps the clerk or delivering carrier identify delivery confirmation mail. Delivery confirmation mail is processed just like ordinary priority mail or parcels. The only difference is that the delivering employee scans delivery confirmation pieces at the delivery point. Delivery confirmation mail is also scanned before being placed in post office boxes. The scanner is placed in a cradle that is linked to a computer database. All of the scanned information is uploaded, and on the evening of the day the mail piece was delivered or delivery was attempted, retail customers can either log on to the World Wide Web or call a toll-free number to confirm the status of the mail piece. Thank you for calling the United States Postal Service. Delivery confirmation provides our customers with the kind of service they've been asking for, an affordable way to confirm when their mail was delivered. The value delivery confirmation provides is not just limited to our customers. It also benefits the Postal Service and its employees. Delivery confirmation is a value-added service that provides greater customer satisfaction and confidence in the Postal Service. Delivery confirmation offers businesses a cost-effective way of managing inventory and preventing fraud. Small business mailers now have a way of confirming delivery to their customers. And it offers all mailers what they've been asking for, the knowledge that their mail got to its destination and the date and time when it was delivered. Thank you very much, sir. Have a nice day. Delivery confirmation benefits postal employees by providing better customer service, thus making the postal service more competitive. Our employees are key partners in assuring the success of delivery confirmation. Delivery confirmation benefits the Postal Service by increasing the volume of packages we deliver, resulting in a greater share in the parcel market and increased revenues. Delivery confirmation is offered electronically and at the retail counter. The electronic option is used mostly by large mailers who are certified to send and receive information electronically. Their mail arrives already labeled and barcoded. An electronic file with information about their shipments is sent directly to our central computer. The retail option is what we sell over the okay. retail counter. So we have a new um, service that's called delivery confirmation. Each clerk is responsible for informing retail customers about delivery confirmation, for knowing the correct acceptance procedures, and for making certain that the proper postage is collected. Although the acceptance process will vary somewhat depending on whether your office has POS1, IRT, or handheld scanners, the fundamental steps are the same. Clearly, the role of the clerk in these transactions is vital. In addition to the key questions that you are already asking to determine customers' needs, how soon do you want to get it there? Do you need proof of mailing or delivery? Do you need insurance? Do you need anything else? Would you like to use your credit debit card? following are a few possible scenarios with key points to remember about delivery confirmation. Hello, how are you today, ma'am? I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. I'd like to send that back, please. Sure. Uh, do you need proof of mailing insurance, or can I tell you about a new service, delivery confirmation? How does that work? Delivery confirmation allows you to know when your mail piece was delivered. It's available now. On priority mail, it's an additional 35 cents. Yeah, I think I'd like to try that. Okay, great. Yeah. Now what we do is we take this piece, affix this to your box. It also needs to be scanned into the system so we can confirm delivery for you. Okay. Your total is going to be $5.75. Would you like to put that on your debit or credit card? I think I just soon pay cash for it. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Could I have a receipt? Please? Sure. Four twenty-five is your change. Okay. 
Okay, one, two, three, four, four dollars and twenty-five cents. This is also yours, okay? This is very important to you because you'll need to dial either the 800 number if you like or you can log on to the web address just okay. to confirm delivery on your package. Super. Thanks Did you need lot. anything else today, ma'am? No, I don't think so. Thank you, though. Okay, you have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Here are the key points to remember from the first vignette. Delivery confirmation allows our customers to know when their article was delivered. It's a fast and inexpensive way to confirm delivery. When processing the mail piece, the clerk must always put the delivery confirmation label above or to the left of the delivery address. At acceptance, the type of equipment you have in your office will determine how you scan the barcode. Offices with POS1 will use the terminal scanner. Offices with Unisys 3 and MOS will use the IRT wand. Offices with Unisys 2 and offices that don't have IRT or PAUSE will use the delivery confirmation scanner. The customer needs the receipt to access delivery information. Okay, sir, here's a copy of your express. There's anything else I can help you with? Well, yes, I need to mail this also. Okay, we have a new service that we're offering. It's called delivery confirmation. Would you like to try it? Is that the same as express mail tracking? No, we don't track the piece through the system. We just confirm the date and time of delivery. Well, that's great. Now I know my son got it. True, and it's a small fee. It's 35 cents. Okay. All right, sir. I scan this in. Okay. Sir, would you like to use your debit or credit card? I'll have to pay cash. Okay. How will I know he got it? Okay, sir, this is going to be your uh, delivery confirmation receipt. We have a website, plus you can use the 1-800 number to get a confirmation of the date and time of the delivery. How soon can I check that? It will be available the night of delivery. Thank you, sir, and have a great day. Thank you. You're welcome. Here are the key points from the second vignette. Delivery confirmation does not track the mail piece. It simply confirms time and date of delivery, attempted delivery, forward or return. The clerk must round date and check the priority mail or standard mail B box on the receipt portion of the label. Delivery confirmation is easy to access by logging on to www.usps.com or calling our toll-free number 1-800-222-1811. A signature is not provided with delivery confirmation. Hi, Ann. How are you today? Hi, Vivian. Here we are. I've been thinking about you. We have a new service that might help your small business and it's called Delivery Confirmation. Great, tell me about it. Okay, Delivery Confirmation allows you to know the date and the time that your mail pieces were delivered. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Can I still purchase insurance and send my packages COD using Delivery Confirmation? Yes, you can still get those special services like registry, COD, and insurance with Delivery Confirmation. And if you do insurance, you can also combine that with um, return receipts. How much does it cost? Well, for priority mail, it's an additional 35 cents, and for standard mail, it's an additional 60 cents. This is going to be really great for my business. Okay. Here are the key points from the third vignette. Delivery confirmation is an affordable feature for small business owners. Delivery confirmation can be purchased in combination with other special services. Registry, insurance, minimum or numbered, COD, special handling, and PAL. And delivery confirmation gives our customers greater satisfaction with the postal service. These vignettes should help you to better inform your customers about how delivery confirmation works. 
Additional training will be provided so that all of our retail clerks will be equipped with the know-how and the information needed to accept delivery confirmation mail and successfully sell it to our customers. Delivery confirmation is a platform that offers value-added services for all postal customers. It's a convenient and affordable way for our customers to know when their priority mail or standard B shipments were delivered and an avenue for providing postal employees with the tools to expand postal service. Good afternoon, Ms. Miller. Delivery confirmation. Just one more way the postal service is using technology to better serve our customers today and in the next century. Hi, my name is Tony Hill, and I want to welcome you to Retail Revenue Refreshers. In today's program, we're going to talk about Media Mail. Media Mail is a valuable service that fills an important shipping need. Publishers, retailers, software companies, and individuals rely on Media Mail's low rates to ship computer readable media, books, and sound recordings such as videotapes, audio tapes, music CDs, and movie DVDs. Media mail is a popular method of delivery for many online retailers and auction sites. However, this popularity is bringing more and more incidents of misuse of media mail. So what items can be sent by media mail? Let's go down the list. Books of at least eight pages. 16 millimeter or narrower width film. Printed music printed objective test materials and accessories, sound recordings such as music CDs and movie DVDs, play scripts and manuscripts, printed educational reference charts, loose leaf pages and binders consisting of medical information, and computer readable media containing pre-recorded information, including guides or scripts prepared solely for use with such media. These things qualify as media mail, but they are not the only things being sent. Some of the items frequently but mistakenly shipped media mail include magazines, posters, except for educational reference charts, blank CDs and blank DVDs, cameras, and baseball or other sports cards. And the Postal Service has found everything from plants to clothes to department store mannequins in containers marked media mail. If individual media mail shipments are found to contain inappropriate items, they're delivered to the recipient postage due. If the recipient refuses to pay the extra postage, the packages are returned to the sender postage due. Everyone loses. Consumers miss out on items they want or end up paying more to get them. Retailers can lose their customers. The Postal Service either loses revenue or incurs extra costs, and all postal customers eventually have to make up the difference. We must assume our customers are not knowingly taking advantage of the Postal Service and other mailers. Therefore, we are working to educate our customers about media mail. Online shippers like eBay and Amazon.com are helping us alert their members to both the value of media mail and the requirements that must be met to use the service. In addition, the Postal Service has produced this information notice for retail associates to give to customers who present a package for media mail shipment. By the way, it's not necessary to give more than one notice to repeat media mail customers. 
And there's also a new Media Mail stamp that clearly indicates Media Mail is subject to inspection. Monitoring the proper use of Media Mail begins here, at acceptance, at the counter. Then, to protect postal revenues and the customers who pay their fair share, the Postal Service conducts spot inspections of Media Mail items. Let's listen in on three Media Mail transactions and see how each one is handled by the retail associate. Hello, how may I help you? I'd like to mail this package, please. Okay. Does it contain anything fragile, liquid, perishable, or potentially hazardous? Nope. We can send it express mail, our fastest service. It comes with guaranteed next day or second day delivery and $100 worth of insurance at no extra charge. Express mail can also be tracked through our website, and proof of delivery is available upon request. There's no rush on delivery, it's just some jazz CDs for my brother. I've heard about media mail, does that sound right? Media mail, can I get that? Do music CDs qualify as media mail? Yes, they do. Media mail comes with certain content restrictions, but some CDs, such as music CDs and recorded books, do qualify. Here's some information on media mail. Now your package will be subject to inspection. Is that okay with you? Oh, no. I'd rather no one else open the package. Then how about priority mail? The rates are low, and it takes two to three days on average. Okay. Let's do it, priority mail. If you want to know when the package is delivered, we can add delivery confirmation. No, that's okay. This customer is eligible to use media mail, but chooses priority mail instead for its privacy and security. Our retail associate performs all of the mystery shopper requirements and completes the transaction. There you are. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Can I help the next customer, please? Hi, how can I help you today? I'd like to mail this package by media mail. Okay, does your package contain anything fragile, liquid, perishable, or potentially hazardous? No, it's just some baseball trading cards for my grandson. Do trading cards qualify as media mail? No, they don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Trading cards cannot be sent by media mail. Here's some information about what qualifies as media mail. How about priority mail? It offers great value and delivery takes two to three days on average. That sounds good. The contents are not eligible as media mail. So the customer picks priority mail and our retail associate performs all of the mystery shopper requirements and completes the transaction. You Thank you and you have a nice day. Thank you. Can I help the next customer, please? Hi, how can I help you? I have three packages here I need to send by media mail. Do any of these packages contain anything fragile, liquid, perishable, or potentially hazardous? Nope. For a few dollars more, you can get our priority mail service, which offers great value, and your packages will get there in about two to three days on average. No thanks. I want to send these by media mail. Media mail comes with special eligibility requirements. Here's some information. Only things like books of eight pages or more, manuscripts, pre-recorded DVDs, and videos qualify. Media mail is also subject to being opened and inspected to ensure that the contents qualify. Is that okay? Inspection, huh? All right. Our retail associate performs all of the mystery shopper requirements and accepts the three media mail packages. Here you are, sir. Great. Thank Thanks you lot. very much. Have Thank a nice you. day. Bye-bye. May I help the next customer, please? Now, to protect postal revenues and the customers who pay their fair share, the Postal Service will conduct spot inspections of media mail items. On the day inspections are conducted, postmasters or their designees will instruct the retail associates to isolate media mail packages. Inspect packages that you believe may not qualify for media mail rates. The belief can be based on an examination of the return address, the size, shape, or weight of the package, or any other factor that calls into question the item's eligibility. When inspecting media mail, some items, like hardbound books, have a pretty distinctive feel. No problem with books. Depending on the placement of the shipping label, you may want to flip the package over and open it from the bottom to avoid damage and to simplify resealing. 
carefully open each package to protect the contents. Verify that the contents are eligible for the media mail rate. Certain items, such as invoices for the eligible contents, may be included in media mail. If you are unsure about an item, please contact your local business mail entry manager or staff for advice. Once you have inspected the contents of the package, record the necessary information on the Retail Media Mail Inspection Log. Complete the Media Mail Inspection Slip, round date it, and place it in the box so it's the first thing the recipient sees when they open the package. Then reseal the package. All packages that are opened must be stamped, opened for inspection by the U.S. Postal Service. Media mail is also subject to being opened and inspected to ensure that the contents qualify. Is that okay? Inspection, huh? Uh, all right. In our next media mail inspection, the book is eligible for media mail rates but the stuffed animal and the games are not. In this case, since all of the contents don't qualify, the entire package doesn't qualify. Again, once you have examined the contents, make the entry in the Retail Media Mail Inspection Log. Next, fill out and round date the Media Mail Inspection Slip. Place it inside and then reseal the package. Stamp the package opened for inspection by the U.S. Postal Service. Media mail packages with ineligible contents must be re-rated at the appropriate mail class. Make sure you mark through all of the media mail endorsements on the outside of the package with a black marker. Then endorse the package with a stamp for the appropriate mail class as determined by the contents. In this case, we endorse the package Parcel Post. Next, stamp the package Postage Due. Fill out and mail the media mail letter for sender, alerting them that the package failed to pass inspection and letting them know that the package is being delivered to the addressee postage due. Now it's time to weigh and re-rate any packages found to contain ineligible items. Make sure you write the amount of postage due legibly on the package. And finally, record the postage due amount on the retail media mail inspection log. Remember, conduct all inspections with sensitivity and professionalism. Whether or not the contents qualify for media mail rates, the items inside are the property of a postal customer and should be treated confidentially. Okay, let's recap some main points about media mail. When customers request media mail service, inform your customers that media mail has special eligibility requirements and is subject to being opened and inspected. Media mail is also subject to being opened and inspected to ensure that the contents qualify. Make sure you give the customer an opportunity to choose an alternative method of shipment if they wish. On spot inspection day, make sure to isolate all media mail packages and inspect the ones you believe may not qualify. Conduct all inspections in a professional manner. Remember, media mail items are the customer's property and should be treated confidentially. Certain incidental first-class mail items, such as invoices for the enclosed merchandise, may be included in the package. If you are unsure if an item qualifies, please contact your local business mail entry manager or staff for advice. Record your inspection in the Retail Media Mail Inspection Log. Fill out and round date the customer's media mail inspection slip, place it in the inspected mail, and reseal the package. Stamp the package opened for inspection by the U.S. Postal Service. If the contents were ineligible for the media mail rate, line through all media mail endorsements and stamp the package with the appropriate mail class. Place the postage due marking immediately below or just to the left of the postage. Fill out and mail the media mail letter for sender. Weigh and re-rate the item and write the amount of postage due clearly on the package. And finally, record the postage due amount on the Retail Media Mail Inspection Log. In closing, Media Mail is an important service. 
one that a lot of customers depend on for timely and economical delivery. And it's important that we deliver on their expectations. But customers also are counting on us to make sure that only qualified shipments travel at media mail rates. So do your part. Help educate your media mail customers and protect postal revenues by keeping an eye on media mail. All right, that'll be 2120 out of 25. Did you enjoy your dinner? Oh, yes, very much. Good. That'll be 1225 mm -hmm. out of 20. Mm -hmm. 89.50 out of 100. That's 89.50, 75, $90, and 10 makes 100. Millions of transactions involving the transfer of money from one person to another take place every day. If you're a clerk or a cashier, any mistake you make is costly. Any mistake means that you or your customer come out on the losing end. So, the cast and I are going to take a few minutes to point out some of the do's and don'ts about handling money. Most transactions involve three simple things. The cost of goods or services sold, the amount given you by the customer, and the amount of change returned to the customer. Simple? Yes. But even with the latest equipment to help you, mistakes can still occur. Now, that was $25. What did you give me? Uh, you said 21 something. Oh, but it says $25. It's a very common error especially when you're using a register that shows the amount tendered. If you get distracted, you can forget which number you're looking at. So, first rule, don't confuse the amount tendered with the amount owed. And here's another common error. Oh, I see. Your correct change is $3.80. Thank you. Well, wait a minute here. This is 50, 70, 75. When you return change from a register that calculates the amount owed, be sure that you still count it out for the customer, like this. Your correct change is $3.80. That's 25, 50, 75, 80, 1, 2, and 3. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you're a clerk or a cashier, you should know how to count out the change, whether your equipment does it for you or not. So, always double check yourself and the machine by counting out the customer's change. When you do it correctly, the money is actually counted three times. Let me show you how it works. That'll be 1225 out of 20. 1225, 1250, 75, 13, 14, 15, 20. That'll be 1225, 50, 75, 13, 14, 15 and twenty dollars. Thank you. I counted to myself, then I counted it out to her, and she counted along with me, making three times. When you use this method, you don't have to add or subtract. You simply count money. You start with the amount of the purchase and count up to the amount tendered. It's easy. It's easy, but mistakes can still occur. See if you can spot the mistake in this transaction. Hi. Hi there. See, that'll be 212 out of five. I have the two cents here. All right, thank you. That'll be 210. 210, 20, 
25, 50, 75, 2, and 3 makes 5. And you just lost a dollar. What? Um, yes, the cashier lost a dollar in that transaction. She might have been confused by that two cents, but that wasn't the real problem. What was it? I handled the two cents all right, simply by deducting it in my head. What I should have done was to mention the dollar denominations as I was counting, like this. 210, 220, 225, 250, 275, three dollars, four and five. So that was 210, 220, 225, 250, 275, Three dollars, four dollars, and five. Thank you. Thank you. So here's the procedure. When counting, mention dollar denominations, even when counting to yourself. Did you notice that I counted the change into the customer's hand? Where I work, they feel this makes the transaction more personal. In some places, they prefer you lay the money out on the counter. Follow the procedures recommended by your management or supervisor. There's another element in that transaction that deserves comment. It's the matter of interruptions. When someone offers you a change like the two cents to reduce the amount of coins, well, that's a common procedure, not too difficult to handle. But interruptions can lead to confusion or even to outright theft. The rule is keep all transactions separate. Don't try to do two things at once. May I help you, sir? Yeah, I'd like my bill, please. Aston 1215. Yes, Mr. Aston, I have it right here. The total is 89.50. Thank you. 89.50 out of 100. All right, 89.50 out of 100, 89.75, While you're at it, could you change this for me? I have to take a cab to the airport. Of course, Mr. Aston. Let me finish this transaction first, then I'd be glad to take care of it. He handled it right. And there are two important points to remember here. Keep transactions separate. Do one thing at a time, and don't permit interruptions. These points are particularly important when you're faced with someone who's out to take you, such as a quick change artist. Interrupting is one of their favorite tricks. What the fast change artist tries to do is to get you confused by interrupting, then offer to help you by telling you what to do. It goes something like this. Will there be anything else? No, thanks. OK, that's $10 out of 20. Your change is $10. Thanks. There you are. Oh, tell you what, I need change for a 50. Let me have the $20 back and just take it out of this. Uh, I'm sorry, do what? Just take it out of the 50 instead of the 20. Oh, here, I see. OK, uh, here's your 20. Uh, 20, 30, 40, 50. Well, she's in trouble. She allowed herself to be interrupted, and she's just lost money. I have $40 from the 50. I also have my original 20 and her 10. I just got $10 worth of merchandise free. And if anybody stops me, I'll just say, it was an honest mistake. Finish one transaction before taking on another. If a customer is honestly changing a bill, she'll understand. If the customer is a professional, you'll avoid coming up short just by refusing to be interrupted. So remember, don't let the customer tell you what to do. Now, let's take a look at some funny money. Here's one, a $20 bill, but Turn it over, and it's a one. <laughs> Someone's going to a lot of trouble to split a 20 and a one and glue the face of the 20 to the back of the one. For an investment of some time and $21, he's ended up with 40, provided you don't look at the back of the bill. Here's another trick called a raised note. An enterprising counterfeiter simply glues the numbers from a larger bill onto the face of a smaller bill. But turn it over, and it's still a one. It's tricks like this that always make me want to look at both sides of any large bill. If you always check the back of any bill of $20 or more, you'll catch most of these tricks. So make it a rule and always check both sides of large bills. Also, check any time you find glue or tape or any sign of tampering on any bill. And now, here's the newest ploy of the counterfeit game. This looks almost exactly like a genuine $50 bill. That's because it's a color photocopy. With this one, the best way to catch it is to feel it. To a person who handles a lot of real money, as you do, a phony will often feel a bit different. That's because counterfeiters can't duplicate the special paper real money's printed on. 
So when you find a bill that feels wrong, just take a moment, open your drawer, and visually compare it with a real bill of the same denomination. However, that's not the end of the scams and ripoffs you might run into. Here's a real tricky one. Hey, that'll be $6.89 out of 10. Children will write on anything, won't they? What? Oh, that, my four-year-old. Is that all right? Sure. Uh, let me give you your change here. A marked bill can be as innocent as child's play, or it can be a setup for another fast buck game. And this one requires two cons working together. We'll show you how it goes. My casual remark to the customer about the markings on the bill wasn't just idle chatter. I was letting him know I noticed it, just in case something like this happened. Now, I'll play the second half of the con team. Enjoy your lunch? Oh, yeah, sure. Good. Now, if I'd been careless and hadn't noticed the markings on the 10 the other man gave me and put this man's five into the drawer like this, then this could happen. That'll be 425 out of five. No, 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 no. I gave you a 10. I'm sure it was a five. I you... gave you a 10. I can prove it. My child wrote all over it. You look in your drawer and you'll see. Aha, there. What did I tell you? So that's why you should always check the markings and leave the money the customer gives you out while you're making change. To avoid all confusion, follow these procedures. Look for marked bills and mention them to the customer. And always keep all bills in view while making change. As long as you have the money in view, there's no question about what the customer gave you. Now, all of this business about funny money brings up a very serious point. What do you do when you're face to face with a con man or a counterfeiter? The first rule is don't ever accuse anyone of trying to cheat you. You will avoid confrontation if you don't permit interruptions and keep large bills in view while making change. But if any argument should arise, call your manager or supervisor. Second, if someone gives you some of that funny money, remember that the customer may be innocent. He or she could have been fooled by the money and believe it's real. Or you may be dealing with a professional counterfeiter. In either case, you may want to create a delay while you get some help. With some equipment, you can do this. That tone suggests that the register is out of order. It makes a good excuse for you to say you have to get help and leave. So when dealing with a suspected counterfeiter, stall for time, notify your supervisor, and don't take risks. And follow the procedures given you by your place of employment. And now, to make sure all of this is clear, here's a brief summary. When you're using equipment which displays the amount tendered, don't get confused or distracted. And when you return the amount owed, be sure to count it out for the customer. When making change, don't add or subtract. Simply count the money, starting with the amount of the bill and ending with the amount given you. And unless instructed otherwise, count it directly into the customer's hand. After counting to yourself, count it aloud to the customer. As he counts with you, the count is checked three times. Mention each dollar denomination when counting to yourself and to the customer. Don't permit interruptions. Handle one transaction at a time. Complete what you're doing, then give the extra service the customer requests. All customers must be treated courteously, so when you refuse to be interrupted, do it with a smile and take special precautions when handling large bills. Always check both sides, watch for tape or glue or special markings, and mention them to the customer. And don't put the customer's money away until the transaction is complete. Finally, if you do run into difficulties with a fast change artist or counterfeit money, don't argue with customers or accuse them. Follow your employer's instructions about notifying your manager or supervisor. Following these basic instructions will help you avoid those embarrassing and costly losses which can occur when you're handling money. And now, on behalf of the whole cast, thanks for watching.
Welcome to starting your new job. You know, there are a lot of different jobs in the world, but they all have certain things in common. The cast and I are going to point out six common work habits that will help you find success in any job. Now, obviously, your job is important to you, but did you know that you are even more important than you may realize to the organization that hires you? We're going to begin with a very simple fact that applies to every job. It's so basic you think it's not worth mentioning, except for one thing. It gets you started right every time you go to work. It's something your friends and co-workers might never mention to you, but it's so important it can even cost you your job. It has to do with something that happens when you're not even on the job, something rather personal. It's your personal appearance. I think of it as a matter of pride. Pride in yourself that reflects pride in your work. You don't have to dress like a millionaire. Idea is to dress in a way that's appropriate for the job you're doing and the organization you're a part of. And don't forget simple common sense cleanliness and well-groomed hair. <laughs> Appearance is especially important if your job puts you in direct contact with customers. If you have a uniform, keep it clean and wear it with pride. The way you look tells your employer and your customers that you care about being at your best on the job. Your appearance is important even if you're a worker who doesn't come in contact with the customer. When your clothes are clean, you're showered and shaved, you're ready for the day's work. Your appearance says, hey, I'm ready to do a good day's work. So watch your appearance, whatever your job. Watch your appearance. Be clean and well-groomed, appropriately dressed and ready for your day's work. When you accept a job, you enter into an agreement with your employer. The employer commits to paying you a certain amount of money. That's the part we all like. <laughs> but what's your commitment as a worker? Well, basically, what you agree to is a commitment of time. More workers are disciplined or terminated over misuse of time than any other factor. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I can't find your work order here just now. Um, I I'm a little short-handed. I, I think I'll have to call you back. Thank you. Bye. Will you please hurry up? Yeah. I'm on my lunch break. Okay. Um, it's got to be here someplace, or maybe it's here. Look, I'm really sorry my partner didn't show up for work today. So? Where's Paul? He's two hours late, and he didn't call in. His work is piling up, and his customers are unhappy. Well, suppose this happens frequently. Then it becomes a question of Paul's dependability. The way I see it is like this. When I sign up to do a job, a relationship exists between me and my fellow workers. When I'm not there and I don't even bother to call in, I'm letting my employer down. So they can't help but think, I just don't care. When you commit yourself to a job, you also commit your time. Don't accept a job if the hours are wrong for you because you'll have trouble keeping that commitment. Step two to job enjoyment and job success. Being dependable about time. Arrive on time, use your time well, and always call in if you're delayed or unable to come. Don't take a job unless you're ready to commit your time. Your second step to job success, commit your time. Be on time or call in. Use time well on your job. Step number three to job enjoyment and success has to do with your first days or weeks on the job. It's a period of learning that often involves special intensive training, and sometimes it's less formal, more a matter of learning as you go. But in either case, it involves a test of your ability to follow instructions. Some instructions are simple, and some are complex. Unfortunately, when you're being trained on the job, even the simplest instruction can become confusing, especially if you don't really listen. So, Anne, let me show you the procedure for ringing up a sale. It's not too complicated, but I want you to watch and listen. First of all, remember that it's computerized and hooked into our central inventory and bookkeeping system. Now, here's the first step. Well, it really doesn't look so complicated. Why is he doing this? I'm not stupid. What did he say? How does that work? Oh, my gosh, I missed that. I hope he doesn't ask me. So you understand all that? Oh, sure. Simple. Thanks a lot. What's wrong with this thing? Excuse me, Paul, I need help here. I can't get this machine to do anything. Something's wrong. 
Anne made two fatal mistakes. First, she didn't really concentrate on the instructions as they were given, and she said she understood when she didn't. I found that when you're learning on the job, it doesn't hurt to ask questions. Your supervisor or trainer can't read your mind, so if you don't understand, you have to say so. Asking questions doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you're smart enough to want to make sure you understand. Here are the rules for following instructions. Listen. Concentrate on what you're being shown. Ask questions. Repeat the instructions back. Do whatever you have to do to clarify the instructions. And third, follow them. Even if you don't understand at first why you must do things a certain way, follow your instructions to the letter. Follow your instructions. Listen, concentrate, ask for clarification if needed, then follow procedures exactly as given. The fourth step in job success has to do with the way you handle the age-old problem of authority. Now, we're not going to try to get inside your head and talk about how you got along with your parents or how you relate to your local police force. We think it's more helpful to talk about something really basic, how you handle criticism. Now, criticism on the job never feels good, but on every job, we all have to relate to our superiors in a constructive way when our performance is reviewed or evaluated. Our self-esteem gets involved, but we'll just have to be prepared at some point in any job to accept criticism. Yes, if you let me have your account number, I'm sure we can help you. 3865023, is that correct? All right, one minute, please. And thank you for calling. Brent, may I uh, see you for a moment, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. You've been with us for three weeks now. How do you feel it's going? Well, it took me a little while to gear into the system, but uh, I think I'm online now, sir. Oh, that's good. But uh, I'm having a little problem with your lack of productivity. Uh, no, no one has complained to me, but... I know that some of the others are working extra hard to keep up the group's quota. Look, I was just taking a little break here, that's all. Oh, I'm not talking about now, Brent. You're not producing as I know you can. Now, whoa, whoa, wait a second here. Get off my back, will you? I mean, I don't see you giving anybody else here a hard time, right? No, it's me. It's always me. It's been that way from the very beginning. Brent has an authority problem, and we all know it. He gets touchy, starts defending himself anytime he's questioned. If he continues this way, I'm afraid he's not going to make it. We all like to feel self-sufficient and on top of things. But the boss wasn't trying to put Brent down. He was trying to help him keep his job by shaping up. We all have to accept a little criticism now and then and learn from it. To learn and grow in your job, sometimes you have to grow as a person. To do that, you have to learn to accept a little criticism. Accept criticism, listen to it, learn from it, and when it comes your way, don't feel put down. Are you a people person? You know, lots of friends, good relationships, always plans for the weekend, well, that's great, I am too, but you know, when it comes to doing a job, we gregarious types sometimes have to be a little careful. For example, listen to this. We're gonna be through here in about an hour. What are you guys gonna do? Why don't we go to that pizza place across the street? Not pizza, we're talking mega calories here. How about that health food place across the block? Wait a second, I got a great idea. This is perfect, we could go down. Uh, right. Cast, cast, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute now. We have a, we have a show to do here, okay? Well, sorry. The point is, we're talking while we should be working. So let's get back to work and talk about how personal relations can interfere with the job. Hello, Aunt. Hi. 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 Well, it's time for the meeting. Where's Cindy? She's on the phone. Again? Look, Mark, that's not what I said. No, that's where you're wrong. Just, just let me tell you what I really said. What? Yes, I'm going to see you this weekend. I said the others were going to the island with Fred on his beautiful new boat. Look, I'm supposed to be in a meeting, so... No, I'm not trying to brush you off. Okay, so I'll take another minute and... 
At what point should your personal life be allowed to interfere with work? We can't say not at all because we all have personal lives to live and sometimes personal problems to solve. Cars that need fixing, wives, husbands or friends who need our attention, even emergencies. And yet, successful workers learn where to draw the line between the job and personal relations. I'll tell you what I do. I have an understanding with my family and friends that I'm available at work for only real emergencies. My wife and I have it set up like this. She doesn't call me at work. I usually call her once a day, usually about the time I take my afternoon coffee break. And we make it brief. I let people know that I don't take personal calls at work. That's one thing. And when it comes to personal relationships with people here, we catch up on all the latest at lunch. Besides that, I think it's very important not to get too involved with my fellow workers. Friendly, yes, and courteous with each other, always. But it's basically a working relationship. A working relationship. So don't let personal relations interfere. Use the phones only for business. Limit your personal calls and socialize only at the proper times. Another aspect of personal relations that's of vital importance to your success is the way you relate to people. By that, I mean simple courtesy. When you work with a group of people on a day-to-day -day basis, a certain amount of friction is bound to develop. Courtesy is the oil that lubricates personal relations. Treat your fellow workers as you would want to be treated. And keep your team running smoothly. And courtesy is especially important for those who work in service jobs, in direct contact with customers and clients. Hi, may I take your order, please? Yes, I'd like two specials to go, please. Okay, would you like anything to drink? No, we have drinks back at the office. Will there be anything else? No, thanks. Okay, thank you for your order. Brent understands the importance of the customer. He was attentive, efficient, and polite. Now, let's see how Cindy handles it. So I told him, back off. I mean, I just met him 10 minutes ago, and there he was. I couldn't <clears> believe it. I'd like to place an order. Mm, we'll be right with you. I mean, I couldn't believe the nerve of that guy. I mean, he was married. Can you believe it? I'm in that? sort of a hurry here, miss. <laughs> okay, what would you like? If it's not too much trouble, I'd like one order to eat here, the special. Mm, fine. What's special? What was I saying? Oh, yeah. It may have been a gross example, but how many times has something like that occurred to every one of us? And how does it make you feel? It makes the customer feel sorry he came in. The customer knows he's important to the success of any service business, and that without customers, that girl wouldn't even have a job. Discourtesy really turns people off. If this was in real life, I'd never come back. One experience like that is all it takes. I didn't even like acting in that scene. For one thing, I hate it when service people chew gum. And what I don't understand is why some people take a job that brings them into contact with the public when they really seem to hate it. One thing you should ask yourself before you take on this kind of job is, do I really want to deal with people? Do I want to be courteous and attentive to their needs, or don't I? And just remember, nothing is more important to your employer than a good relationship between you and the customer, unless it's a good relationship between you and your fellow worker. In any case, make courtesy a habit, and you'll do well in any job. Be courteous to fellow workers and customers. Treat them as you like to be treated. Say please and thank you. Make courtesy a habit. And now we come to our final step to success and enjoyment in your job. And this one sort of sums up the other six. In fact, it's the secret of improving your performance in every way. It's called self-evaluation. Now, self-evaluation isn't something rare, a talent only certain people possess. It's really something we all do in a lot of different ways. Good, down a pound. A scale is a device for evaluating weight, or your health, or how well you stick to your diet. It's too bad there isn't some simple device for helping us check up on how well we're doing on our jobs. That you have to do in here, in your own head. Evaluate yourself in terms of the things we've talked about in this program. First, your appearance. Ask, am I as clean and well-groomed as I'd like to be? Do I look ready to work, ready to meet customers, ready to handle my responsibilities? Am I as careful about my appearance as when I interviewed for this job? How do you check yourself out on your fitness as a worker? 
Well, one way is to ask yourself, how dependable am I when it comes to being on time and using time well on the job? Sometimes it helps to write down your self-evaluation. List the positive and the negative. Ask yourself, how well do I know my job? Am I learning and growing in it? Am I using the available resources on the job to improve my skills? Am I following correct procedures and instructions as given to me? To find out how you accept authority and handle criticism, ask yourself about stress. Do I dread going to work because of some unsolved relationship? Am I uncomfortable with my supervisor or other workers? Why? What can I do about it? Is there some other attitude I could take that would lessen the stress for me and for them? Mark, I really have to go now. See you Saturday. Bye. Human relationships. How do you evaluate them? Well, it still comes down to asking yourself some questions. Are my personal relationships tying up the phones? Or am I so involved with friends on the job that we aren't getting the work done? Are we wasting time? How much time, attention, and real energy am I giving to my work? In a lot of service jobs, customers are given forms to fill out, telling how they like the service. Well, don't wait for them to tell you. Evaluate yourself. Ask yourself about courtesy. Listen to yourself as you deal with customers and fellow workers. Are you treating all of them the way you'd like to be treated? No machine or other device has yet been invented that can test your progress on the job. Anne's right. The self-evaluators right in here. Use it. And evaluate your own appearance, use of time, following instructions, acceptance of criticism, relations on the job, and courtesy to fellow workers and customers. This final word on the subject, remember, Every job you take on is important to you and to your employer. Maybe it's just for the money. Maybe it's not the career you have in mind for the future. Maybe it's just a part-time job. But for now, it's your job. And the work habits and attitudes you are developing now will affect the rest of your working life. Give it your best shot. And uh, thanks for watching. Hello, everybody. Uh, now, I want to talk about what is absolutely sure to be your favorite customer, because, uh, you know, you don't get a chance to meet your favorite, favorite customer a lot. I want to ask you, how much do you really love those irate customers? By a show of hands, those irate customers. I, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's irate. I know I caught some of you off guard with that, and you're thinking about it a little bit. In fact, most people don't like to deal with irate customers very much because, uh, you know, they kind of make the day a little long and they, they affect us in some ways that are not really all that pleasant. Have I said that delicately enough so far? <laughs> but, you know, some people actually do kind of get into handling irate customers or dealing with angry customers because many of us have found that uh, if you do the right things by them, they become customers and almost buddies for life. Uh, so the person that was almost unmanageable a few moments ago is, from here on out, very easy to deal with and even becomes an advocate of the Postal Service if you use the right skills. And a lot of people use the right skills for cooling off hot customers. And we're going to talk about seven things I'd like you to consider when you're faced with a hot customer. And I'll go through them first, and then we'll go and break them out a little bit, and then we'll summarize at the end. The first thing is to keep your cool. That's number one. Number two is to listen without interrupting. Number three is to acknowledge what you've heard and apologize, whether it's your fault or not. Number four is to ask questions to clarify and gain additional information and also, by the way, make people feel like you really care. Uh, the fifth step is to propose solutions. Is that number six? Fifth step is to propose, next step is propose solutions. Fix it on the tape. 
<laughs> Next step is to propose solutions. And the final step is to follow up. Follow up with the customer. Now let's look at all those and kind of uh, take them. Uh, the first one may be the most difficult one. Keep your cool. If a customer comes in irate and they take your cool away from you, I'll tell you, they own you at that point and they know it. In fact, that's their job. Their job is to help you join them in their misery. And if they're able to do that, probably this is going to take a lot longer to resolve and, and it may end up even getting other people behind them involved, okay? <laughs> Keeping your cool is difficult, though. Even when they say stuff, especially when they say, the, you know that phrase you really love, I pay your salary. Ooh, I know you love that one, don't you? Look at you, twitching in the seats now. Ooh, uh. Now, this is not a time to say, no, you don't, and all this other kind of stuff. The point is, do these people really pay your salary anyway? Absolutely they do. Because without the money they bring through the front door, there's no reason for you to come in through the back door. The reason they're saying this is maybe uh, not just because it, about taxes and all the other stuff. I think people intuitively understand that's not going on. But they're saying this, well, since you didn't listen to me when I acted like a customer, maybe you should treat me differently if I act like your boss now. They're raising the stakes a little bit. That's what angry people do. People tend to get angry when they believe no one is what? Listen. Listening to them. So keep your cool. By the way, they may not be mad at you anyway. Usually they're not. Sometimes they're mad at the situation they're in because of the Postal Service. And frankly, sometimes they're just mad. Some people are just mad people. Don't let that be something that uh, attaches itself to you. I would prefer you to think more Teflon than Velcro with step number one, okay? Teflon versus Velcro. Keep your cool. Second step, listen without interrupting. When they get started, you let them go. Now, how many of you have found, by a show of hands, that if you just let them go, it ends a lot more quickly than if you try to interrupt, by a show of hands? Just let them go. In fact, uh, a lot of you deal with customers over the phone. One of the most interesting things you can do for a customer that's complaining over the phone is just say not a word. Because usually, after a few moments, you'll hear this. Are you there? <laughs> is someone listening to me? Are you there? Have you ever heard that before? Let me tell you something real cool you can say at that point that will help the process even more. I used to use it when I worked in a, a telephone conference center, telephone communication center with a long distance phone company. Here's what we used to say. Are, is anybody there? We used to say this. Yes, I am. But the last thing I want to do is interrupt you because I can tell what you're saying is important. So you let me know when you're finished. It was usually all over with at that point, except maybe they'd say something like this. Oh, that's it. <laughs> or, you know, something like that because they got to throw one more in there, okay? <laughs> Listen without interrupting. Not just because it gets the uh, chatter over with more quickly, but if you're listening, you'll probably find out that a lot of the solutions will come clear to you already just by listening to what's going on right at that point. Okay? So the first step is to keep your cool. The next step is to listen without interrupting. The third step is to acknowledge what you've heard and apologize. Now, this is not an easy step for a lot of people because uh, many people want to say, well, it's not my fault. Why am I apologizing? Well, it's not about fault. It's about uh, understanding how to cool off hot customers. Some customers, just an apology is all they want. In fact, they've even told you all that sometimes. Some people will say, I am not leaving here until somebody does what? Apologizes. And that's all they want. Uh, so if you think that you're apologizing because of you personally, then that means you may have missed step number one already, the keeping your cool part. If you're keeping your cool, you're able to see that just apologizing is all I need to do. I'm sorry, not for the Postal Service. You don't have to be the spokesperson on behalf of the U.S. Postal Service, we would like to offer our most sincere. You don't have to get into all of that. Sometimes it'll be something like this. I am so sorry this has been so confusing for you. You didn't say that anything the, the Postal Service did was wrong. You just are sorry that this person has to feel so confused or so upset or that somebody didn't give you the right information. doesn't matter who. Apologize. And by the way, you acknowledge what you heard very easily. And uh, uh, this is the best way to prove to people that you're listening, just to paraphrase it back lightly to them. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. In other words, what you just said was, let me see, uh, we did this, this, this. You go right through the line because you proved to them that maybe you're the first person they believe has ever what? Listen. Listen. Does that go a long way toward cooling people down? You got it. Now, sometimes you're going to have some of the information in the ranting and raving, but not all of it, and you need additional information. Make sure to ask good questions and get right to the point. In fact, there's a couple of types of questions that people tend to use that tend to help them out a lot. One is open-ended questions, and the other ones are closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions usually generate a lot more um, detailed response. Explain to me what happened, uh, exactly what happened in your, as far as you, uh, take me from the beginning. Those are open-ended type of uh, questions or responses where you want a more detailed idea. 
Then you have closed-ended responses, where you're just basically looking for a specific point of information, and usually that point of information is one or two words, yes or what, no. Now, strategically, these questions are good to ask because they gather more information. They're also strategically good because they control the conversation more. Some people are very angry and don't express themselves very well. And so asking somebody that, a bunch of uh, closed-ended questions when they already are not talking will not get you very far. If you I'm just mad. Did it happen yesterday? Yes. Does it happen before? Yes. We're not making very much headway here, are we? <laughs> OK? That's the person that need, you need to say something or might want to say something like, explain to me what happened so that they can do it. Now, you have other people that will explain it to you again and again and again. We don't need to go too open-ended with these people. Could you tell me for the 50th time uh, what happened to you specifically? Those are the people that you want to ask yes or no questions of. Did it happen recently? Yes. Which day? Thursday. So you can get them focused on what you're doing, OK? Asking questions not only to clarify and gain information, but also to control the conversation. Now, what I find from uh, what I've learned from talking to a lot of you is what you find out is that a lot of times the customer is mad, not because of what the Postal Service has done technically, but because of what they thought the Postal Service was going to do. It's usually a matter of either uh, wrong information or no information. An omission of information, as a matter of fact, is very important. That's why when you talk about things like delivery confirmation to customers, that you make sure on the front end that you explain to them you know, that this is not tracking and tracing, but this is delivery confirmation. Because a lot of customers that are transferred, uh, moving a lot of their service from express mail to priority, as we've spoken about before, may not have made that leap in terms of the fact that the service is not the same. And they're mad because no one told them that. In fact, you'll hear that. That's why sensitively educating them is important. Very important to sensitively bring people around on the correct information, because you can really paint them to look like kind of idiots, depending on how you ask them. Here's a good question not to ask an angry customer. Why'd you do that? <laughs> There's a word missing at the end of that statement. Idiot. Do you hear it? You can hear it. What were you thinking about? <laughs> you know, those little things do not necessarily calm people down. So when you educate them, educate them and let them know that it's OK. In fact, some people do some things that are very interesting along this lines. What they'll say is something like this. You know, I'm sorry that happened to you. A lot of people are confused about that. Let me explain to you how that actually works. So they don't feel like they're the only one. Because sometimes that's the hard part, is that I'm the only one that doesn't get it. Everybody with me? So sensitively educate your customer. Then you want to propose some solutions. In some cases, there's not much you can do, depending on what the issue is. But in a lot of cases, there are steps you can take. And if there are steps that you're going to take as a postal employee, clearly tell me what they are. Uh, here's something that does not work very well for an IRA customer. Oh, we'll handle it. That's not what I want to hear. What do I want to hear? What specifically are you going to do? How long will it be taking, da 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 Because I want to know that there's a process here. Because as far as I know, up to this point, it hasn't felt like there's one. So you need to reassure me by giving me a process, OK? Now, if there's something the customer needs to do differently, then you need to kind of give them that as an olive branch to keep them from being in this situation the next time. So here's what we're going to do, da 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 In the future, let me tell you what you might want to do to avoid being in this situation again. And now, it's a helping mode. Because this person that's telling me these things, obviously, is not only trying to calm me down now, but is trying to keep me from being in this situation going forward. Okay? So proposing solutions. And then there's follow-up. Uh, not all issues that you deal with across the window are going to be specific to you doing follow-up, but sometimes follow-up is a pretty important thing. In fact, if you're going to follow up with a customer and tell them something uh, or give them some information that you promised them, there's a, a mindset that works really well, especially with IRA customers. And that mindset is to under-promise and over-deliver in terms of a time frame. Under-promise and over-deliver. If you think it's going to take you about a day to get this information, tell them you'll be, I'll make sure to talk to you, I'll be contacting you within the next three days. Because if it takes a day and you say, I'll talk to you today, and then the rest of the world happens to you, and now it becomes two days, now you become a next person in the line of the people that have broken the promise to me. Everybody with me? So under promise, over deliver. It makes you a real hero if you do it in less time, but it really doesn't paint you that well if it takes longer than what you said. And by the way, if you're waiting for information to follow up and you haven't gotten that information, follow up to tell me that. In fact, that will give you a lot more time with a lot of IRA customers. I just wanted to let you know that I haven't what? Anybody know what goes in that spot? Forgotten about you. You want to make, nothing makes people more angry than not to be listened to and to be forgotten about. 
And all these steps address those two things. We're assuring people that we're listening and that we have not forgotten about them. I just want to let you know I hadn't dropped the ball on this. I'm still looking forward to it. And you know, a lot of people will tell you when you say that. They'll literally say, well, I'm glad you called. I'm just glad you haven't what? Forgotten, forgotten about me. And that will sometimes give you a lot more time than you had even before that call to work with. Follow up, follow up, follow up. It makes customers know that you're part of the process and that you're part of the solution too. Those seven steps again are to keep your cool, listen without interrupting, acknowledge what you've heard and apologize, and apologize even if it's not your what? Oh. There you go. The next one talks about asking questions to clarify, gain information, and to control the conversation. Also, moving towards sensitively educating your customers because a lot of the problems they're having is not because of something you did, it's because of something they did not know. So make sure you do that delicately. Make sure you propose solutions about how you're going to fix this one and avoid the next ones so they don't even exist. And the last one is to make sure to follow up. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Nobody likes dealing with angry customers, but I tell you, there's a system and a process that if you use it, will work every time to cool the hot customers down. Thank you for your time, and you go get them. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Hey, you all still out there? Well, uh, since you're here, just want to say thanks for watching. And I know we covered a lot of information. And if you want some more information about the topic you just saw, visit the Postal website at the address you see on the screen. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. There was a time not long ago that when we thought of our bank, we thought of a place, a building. Convenient or not, we needed to go there. Today, the bank has become something else entirely because our lives have become something else entirely. The reason? Time. There's less and less of it for all of us, whatever we're doing, no matter where we are, which is why it's time for the post office to deliver on a new promise. It is the tradition of the Postal Service to change as its customers change. Making people come to us for our services is going to make us irrelevant very quickly. So we've forged a new vision, a vision for bringing the post office to the people. We will be where our customers are and serve them where they are, at home, at work, out of town, around town, day or night. What's important is for us to be where the people are. And what that means is taking the post office to our consumers. In the past, our strategy has been to do what's most convenient for us. We're not always where people spend their time or money. We're often in inconvenient places. We have no common branding, no common face. Today, we touch people when they come to us. Tomorrow, We'll touch people as they live their lives. We're online. We're in vending. We're in department stores. We're in grocery stores. Our mandate is to provide universal service. We should treasure this. It's what makes us unique. We are a government organization. We are the oldest institution in the history of the United States. We have to provide the American people with the best quality service that we possibly can every day. Turning universal service into universal access is our challenge, our opportunity, giving our customers our one brand close at hand. It allows us to extend our brand and be one postal service in store and out of store. How do we get there? We leverage our existing assets and we create new ones. We touch everyone, everywhere, every day, like nobody else in the world. We have a strong brand image. We must preserve and grow that brand. People consider us government at its best. We are an American institution, forever a part of the communities we serve. More and more, we understand our customers and their needs. We're interested in providing service to the customer, making it easy for them to come in and do business with us. We know that if we pay attention to our customers and what they need, and if we speak to them about all we have to offer, we not only help them build their business, but we build our business. And you, our 800,000 employees, are our most powerful asset. We're not going to be successful at accomplishing our vision unless the people in the retail channel 
are the best that they can be. And our retail channel is also one of our strongest assets. It accounts for the majority of priority and express mail sales. Delivery confirmation, tremendous step forward. Global priority mail is another step forward. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Special services and the bundling of all these services is another creative way to, to meet that customer need. The store and visual merchandising signage systems that you have available, they're not just pretty. We're not doing interior decorating. We need to have core signage in our retail outlets about all of our products and services constantly. Our retail network is unparalleled. With about 33,000 post offices nationwide, we serve 7 million customers a day. With universal access, it could be even more. Whatever it takes to meet our customer requirements, those are the things that we're going to have to do. We'll touch them day or night, wherever they are with self-service terminals that work around the clock seven days a week and by extending hours. We've got 1-800-ASK-USPS and we'll serve our customers inside grocery stores and other convenient locations. We will continue to have stamps on consignment and more shared sites. We'll be there for the business traveler with our updated vending. It will change how people use the Postal Service, giving them more ways to pay like debit or credit. In the next five years, we're planning for 24 hours, seven day a week access. And that means brand recognition across the board as we move into the future. Small businesses are very, very busy people. And Postal Services is one organization that can help their business grow. Many of them need to have the availability of products and services at home, new ways to put postage into their home offices new ways to use meters. When they can't come to the Postal Service, we want to have our services in places where they go to conduct other business. We are going to touch people in their homes. They can order several of our goods and services all online. One-stop shopping right there on their computer. That's what convenience is all about. And we can't forget the importance of stamps. What we're doing with stamps and bringing the post office to the American people is making stamps available everywhere, every day, where Americans are. To reach this vision, we have to take bold steps, every one of us. Retail needs to be profitable, developing new customers, new products, simply selling more of what we have. Our next bold step, measurable access standards. We need to commit to a higher level of service for our customers. Building a new post office won't be the first solution anymore. No place does our brand get more exposure than at retail, which is why we'll need aggressive brand management, giving us the opportunity to protect, grow, and leverage that brand. We'll help our retail managers and clerks develop customer service skills, and that includes everyone. We have to set up a methodology so that everyone knows where, what is the target and we want to help the field with those necessary skills so they can get that target. So that they know, here's what your sales goals are, here's what your customer satisfaction goals are, so that they know where they want to get to. Lastly, we have to re-engineer our back-end processes. And we have to measure it all against clear performance standards. So we can all succeed together. Without each of you supporting this vision and keeping it alive, We'll never reach our goal. Retail is a dynamic business. It must change with changing customer needs. If we're going to survive, we have to be in the marketplace and we have to provide what our customers are looking for. It still comes down to how you interact with that customer on a one-on-one -on -one basis every day. Every customer, every time. If we continue to be responsive to what the customer needs, we can't help but have a winner taking us into the next millennium. By bringing the post office to the people, we can serve them where and when they need us. When we do that, we are keeping our promise to bind the nation together, to help its people stay in touch, even in a world that's more complicated than ever before. Time simply doesn't stand still, and neither will we.
Hello everyone, I want to share with you a few thoughts on diversity and stress the importance of having a workplace that's free of discrimination and sexual harassment. Let me begin by saying I'm fully committed to making diversity a powerful force for the United States Postal Service. In fact, it's our policy to value and manage the diversity of employees, customers, and suppliers. This means building an inclusive environment that respects everyone's uniqueness. And it means encouraging contributions from different backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives. When you think about it, there's more to diversity than skin color. There's age, gender, cultural background, belief systems, even the way we think, dress, and talk. Really, diversity is all the differences that make us unique. And we all have to do a better job of understanding, appreciating, and making the most of those differences. We must take the time to understand where people are coming from without labeling certain behaviors as right or wrong simply because we're not accustomed to them. Too often, we make decisions, sometimes critical decisions, based on favoritism, bias, and blanket judgments formed in our past. It's time to use our intelligence and understanding to recognize the many different backgrounds, approaches, and talents at our disposal, and to use that understanding to take the most effective actions we can. Having a diverse workforce isn't just a legal requirement, and it's not just good business sense. It's really critical to who we are, to our mission. It's a leadership imperative for the Postal Service. We're the most visible representative of government this country has. We're the one hand that reaches out and touches America every single day. We literally bind the diverse nation together. And I believe that the only way we can continue our historic role and stand as a model of good government is to be leaders in harnessing the power of diversity. It's key to our corporate success because it affects every aspect of our organization, employees, customers, and suppliers. Diversity in the United States Postal Service is defined as the mixture of differences and similarities of our employees, customers, and suppliers. Managing diversity is the responsibility of every employee, not only the Diversity Development Department or the Diversity Development Specialist, but every employee. Having a diverse workforce now and in the future is critical to the success of the Postal Service. I have a philosophy that I only want the best people on my staff, and I only want to surround myself with the best people. And I could care less whether they were black, green, blue, red, or what. Think about how this country is changing. Think about the things that we can do to be the leaders as far as diversity is concerned. Our competitors are smart. They also want to attract the best employees. Therefore, we are competing for the same employees. To compete in the 21st century, we need the best. We cannot let our competitors get the best. Our workforce at all levels must represent the communities we serve. To be part of the community means we do business with the community. Take the time to know who your suppliers are and if they represent your community. Remember, we all have the responsibility to build an inclusive environment that respects the uniqueness of every individual and encourages the contributions of people from different backgrounds and perspectives. We have to treat everyone fairly and with respect. We all have the ability to make a difference. Together, we will continue to be the best. Sexual harassment is a serious problem for all employers. And the United States Postal Service is committed that it will not exist in our workplace. We want to be a great place to work so that we are a great place for customers to bring their business. Sexual harassment is totally incompatible with creating the workplace we want 
and need to strive. So let me be clear. The Postal Service will not tolerate sexual harassment. Let me repeat that. The Postal Service will not tolerate sexual harassment. We also believe that education and communication are the keys to prevention. Our managers and our employees must have the tools and the will to recognize sexual harassment and eliminate it. The Postal Service is as diverse an organization as you'll find. Our 800,000 employees represent a vast array of talents and backgrounds. I think it's important that you know we will continue to focus on and encourage positive work relationships for all employees. And we will continue to create an environment for everyone that is free from discrimination and sexual harassment, neither of which can nor will be tolerated. Thanks for listening. postage stamp could do for you. I gave a letter to the postman. He put it in his sack. Bright and early next morning, he brought my letter back. The Office Department is even now planning to experiment with the use of guided missiles for the transmission of your mail. I don't care how much money I got to spend. Before too many years, your mail will be delivered by rocket from New York to California. No doubt you have been thinking about a career for yourself after you graduate from high school. If so, you should consider a career in the United States Postal Service. Let's see what work you might be doing in this service. Window clerk? Or desk clerk? The pay is good. Your first two weeks check will probably look like this. Before deductions. Good people of Truro, Massachusetts, may I kindly have your attention. In order to facilitate your shipping needs, I'd like to remind you that all packages must be properly wrapped. This one is an example of go home and do it again. I think you know what I mean, Mrs. Magician. <laughs> Brown paper and triple twist twine are the preferred media. Thank you for your time. Okay, C, express mail to the air. Kevin. Wow. Kevin, that's funny. You just, you don't have like a Kevin. You don't remember me, but we, we used to work together. I never worked in a funeral home. There's something I can do for you, Slick. OK, uh, straight to the point. You are a former agent of a top secret organization that monitors extraterrestrials on Earth. We're the men in black. We have a situation, and we need your help. There is a free mental health clinic at the corner of Lilac and East Valley. Next. Excuse me. Hey. 
20 Rugrats stamps, please. Elizabeth, the United States Postal Service hasn't quite kept up with today's youth, but I can offer you some nice uh, Berlin airlift stamps. No. Uh, opera legends? No. American Samoa? No. Amish quilts? Excuse me, sweetie, I'm sorry. Got a world to save here. There was no coma. It was all a cover. Who are you? The question is, who are you? I'm the postmaster of Truro, Massachusetts, and I'm ordering you to leave these premises. Okay. Said decaf. All right. All right, people, we have a breach. Farrell cordoned off this area. Billings, I'll have a full perimeter wipe down right here, right now. Okay. Farrell, get him off and escort all non essential civilian personnel from this side immediately. Yes, sir. Listen to yourself, Kay. Who talks like that? Why do you think you're so comfortable here? Just about everybody works in a post office as an alien. Hello, my name is Ken Chapman, and I'm the manager of the Aviation Mail Security Group at headquarters. The Postal Service is committed to improving the acceptance and processing of hazardous materials. We're sharing this information with retail acceptance employees to reinforce the standard acceptance procedures for parcels. These procedures must be followed. This training is important to the safety of our employees, customers, and the traveling public. The Postal Service defines hazardous materials as any article or substance designated by the U.S. Department of Transportation as being capable of posing an unreasonable risk to health, safety, or property during transportation. Typically, people associate hazmat with dangerous chemicals. However, hazmat can be found in a wide variety of common household and consumer products. Many items that we routinely use around the house contain materials that by definition make them hazardous. Unfortunately, because we are familiar with these products, many people take it for granted and do not realize that these products have the ability to cause harm. Hazardous materials are generally defined by properties associated with the material. Is the material capable of burning or exploding? Common flammable items include cosmetics, such as hairspray, nail polish, and perfume. Fuel, such as gasoline, diesel fuel, butane, and lighter fluid. Some paints, adhesives, matches, cigarette lighters, and flares. Can the material destroy body tissue, metals, or plastic? Materials with corrosive properties include cleaning compounds, such as drain or oven cleaner, acid and base compounds, battery fluids, lye, many dyes, bleach, and mercury. Is the material poisonous? Toxic materials typically encountered include pesticides and herbicides, and anything considered an irritant, such as pepper spray or tear gas. The most common hazardous materials found in the mail are items classified as biological hazards. These items include clinical specimens, such as blood or other bodily fluid samples mailed for diagnostic testing infectious substances which are known or suspected to contain an etiologic agent or toxin which affects humans and animals, biological products such as vaccine, and used sharps, including syringes and scalpel blades. In addition, there are some materials that do not possess these properties but still present a hazard during transportation. The most common examples are dry ice, radioactive materials, and magnetized materials, like some speakers. There are many types of labels used to identify a material as hazardous. The most common labels are the Department of Transportation hazardous materials labels. The presence of most DOT labels makes the parcel unacceptable for mailing. 
When a parcel bears the ORMD label, which stands for Other Regulated Materials Class D, or ORMD air labels or markings, it must be assumed that the parcel contains hazmat. Most of the hazardous materials acceptable for mailing can be reclassified as an ORMD consumer commodity. Poster 298, entitled DOT Hazardous Materials Warning Labels, has been designed to assist retail acceptance representatives with recognition of these labels. Other common labels that could indicate that a parcel contains hazmat include the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA label, the Hazardous Material Identification System, HMIS label, and the Chemical Hazard Identification and Training, CHIT label. Any parcel bearing a shipper's declaration contains hazmat. A shipper's declaration is required for most hazardous materials parcels destined for air transportation. The greatest challenge we have today is when customers present reused boxes for mailing. A lot of times, our customers may go to their local grocery store to get used boxes to reuse for mailing. These boxes may have contained liquor, perfume, bleach, or other cleaning materials. Parcels bearing prohibited or hazardous materials markings are unacceptable for mailing unless the markings have been removed or completely blotted out. This is the mailer's responsibility. Postal employees are forbidden from removing or altering labels or markings on packaging. Poster 81 has been designed to inform customers about reused boxes. Now that we've given you some basic information, how does it apply to you, the retail associate? It might help you to think in terms of SAFE, SAFE. The S in SAFE stands for standard procedures to follow, and that includes check the delivery and return address, Requirements for domestic and international mail are different based upon the services required. Be on the lookout for parcels addressed from or to a laboratory, hospital, university, a chemical company, or similar business. Conduct a visual inspection of package labels, markings. Things to look for include a manufacturer's name on the parcel indicating a chemical or cosmetics manufacturer or similar company. Also, look for pre-printed markings indicating hazardous or restricted materials such as liquor, bleach, hairspray, and like items, and of course, hazardous materials warning labels. Be sure to look for stains or leaks. Leakage and stains are evidence of inappropriate packaging and the parcel must be rejected. Be aware of any unusual odors. Do the shake test. Parcels that have the sound of broken glass, shifting weight, or a liquid sound may indicate a prohibited item. A. Act and maintain professionalism. Maintain eye contact. Listen to the customer. Wait for the customer to finish speaking and know your material. The F in SAFE is the most important. Follow up the visual inspection with the question, does the parcel contain anything liquid fragile, perishable, or potentially hazardous. E. Educate our customers. Make use of the most current reference materials when you're talking with customers. We need your help. Sales and Services Associates, Window Clerks, Supervisors, Managers, and Postmasters. Anybody who accepts packages must know our rules, regulations, and standards about hazardous materials. Supervisors and postmasters need to support sales and service associates. There may be times when a conflict arises with the customer over the mailability of a package. Our answers must always be consistent from person to person and from office to office. These standard procedures must be followed at every post office, station, branch, and contract postal unit. We have covered a lot of material. Now, let's apply this material to some customer transactions. Hi, how can I help you today? I just stopped by to mail this package for my wife. Okay, well, let's see if I can help you out here. Does this contain anything fragile, perishable, liquid, or potentially hazardous? I'm not quite sure what's in it. Uh, she just gave it to me on the way out the door. 
Well, I need to make sure before we can accept it. Is there any way you can find out the nature of the contents? I'm sure that my wife didn't put anything dangerous in there. Can't you just accept it this one time? No, I'm sorry, I can't do that. We have to make sure that we can handle it and get it there safely. Is this something new? I mean, I've, I've never been asked the contents before. No, this isn't a new requirement. These procedures have been in place for quite some time. Here's the latest brochure that explains what we're talking about, and just like it says, some things were never meant to be mailed. Why do I have to handle this? Isn't this your job? Well, actually, I'm here to help you. But uh, let's see, I think it's here in this brochure. Uh, oh, right here. It is a mailer's responsibility to ensure they do not mail anything which can injure persons or property. Okay, okay, I'll call my wife to make sure what's in it, but I'm sure it's nothing hazardous. Well, as soon as you find out, step right back up to my window and I'll help you out. You don't have to wait in line anymore. Thanks. Sure, thanks. The retail associate handled this situation very well. Let's make a checklist to review and see if the associate followed the safe procedures. Did the associate follow the standard procedures? She verified the addresses. Check. She conducted a visual inspection of the package. Check. She did the shake test. Check. Next, did the associate act in a professional manner? She maintained good eye contact while talking with the customer. Check. She listened to what the customer had to say. Check. She let the customer finish what he was saying. Check. The next step, did the associate follow up with the key question? Does this contain anything fragile, perishable, liquid, or potentially hazardous? That's it. Check. And for the last one, did the associate educate the customer? She explained the procedure. Check. She used the brochure when talking with the customer. Check. And, as an added bonus, she even referred to the contents of the brochure while talking with the customer. Check and bonus check. Great job. And did you notice the associate did a couple of subtle things to help manage the transaction? She used the Notice 107 to add credibility to what she was explaining. If you're able to show the customer in writing what you're talking about, it will make it easier to understand. Let's take a look at another transaction. Good afternoon. How can I help you? I need to mail this care package out to my granddaughter in college. Does this parcel contain anything liquid, fragile, perishable, or potentially hazardous? Just homemade cookies and some clothes. We have a little problem with this box. I see that it's printed with ORMD and some bleach markings here. Now, that means that the box contained hazardous materials. Are you sure the package doesn't contain any hazardous materials? Just cookies and clothes. In order to mail this, you have to mark out these markings so they can't be read. So what's the big deal? It's been used before. I don't understand. Let me explain. When this box goes through our mail handling process, our employees look at all of the labels and information on the package. Now, when they see this ORMD, that means that the box contained hazardous materials. You told me that it only has cookies and clothes, but our employees don't know that. So, all they have to go by are the markings on this box. Hmm. I didn't know about that. Can you cross it out for me? I'm sorry, we're not permitted to cross these markings out. I can let you use my marker, though, here. Oh, and by the way, when you mark them out, make sure that you completely mark out the markings. That poster on the wall explains this policy. And if you'll just step over here while you do that, I'll help the next customer. When you get finished, come back over and I'll help you out. Thank you. Thank you. This scenario focused on one of the most frequent problems we encounter reused boxes. The sales and services associate handled this situation very well. Let's get our safe checklist out to see how she did. Did the associate follow the standard procedures? She verified the addresses, check. She conducted a visual inspection of the package and found the ORMD and bleach markings, check. She did the shake test, check. Next. Did the associate act in a professional manner? She maintained good eye contact while talking with the customer. Check. She listened to what the customer had to say. Check. She let the customer finish what she was saying. 
check. The next step, did the associate follow up with the key question? Does this parcel contain anything liquid, fragile, perishable, or potentially hazardous? That's it. Nice job. Check. But wait a minute. In this scenario, she asked the question a second time for clarification. Are you sure the package doesn't contain any hazardous materials? And for the last one, did the associate educate the customer? She explained why the box couldn't be used as it was presented and instructed the customer on how the parcel could be corrected to allow acceptance. Check. And now, let's take a look at our third transaction. Hi, how can I help you today? Hi, I need to mail these cosmetics out to a customer. Okay, I see your parcel has an ORMD label on it. Does a parcel contain anything liquid, fragile, perishable, or potentially hazardous? Uh, yes, it contains some aerosol hairspray. I mail these products out all the time, so I'm familiar with the requirements. All right, sounds like you've been through this before. I just want to let you know that this has to go by surface transportation. That's the way I've always sent it in the past. Because it has to go by surface, our mailing options are limited. How soon does it have to be there? Well, like I said, I've been through this before. I'd like to get it out as fast as possible. Because we have to use package services, this package will arrive in five to seven days. That's the way it always is. I just wish there was a way I could get it out sooner. Well, in the future, you can check our regulations to see if your product is acceptable for air transportation. If it is acceptable for air shipment, that gives us a whole lot more options, like uh, priority or express mail. Thanks. That's good to know. Would you like insurance or confirmation of delivery? Uh, no, thanks. Have you seen our phone cards? Would you like one? Oh, no, I'm fine. Would you like to put this on a debit or a credit card? Oh, yeah, I think I'll put it on my debit card. Here you go. Would you like cash back? No, thanks. Nice job. Before we go to the checklist, let's talk about the old, how soon would you like it to arrive question. Now, some of you may be wondering why the associate even asked the question, since there really weren't a whole lot of options available. By asking the question, the associate was able to open up the line of communication. She reaffirmed that the customer knew when the package would arrive. The customer had experience mailing this type of material. So, she already knew it would be traveling by surface. However, the associate then took the opportunity to educate the customer about ORMD air. Who knows? In the future, that customer may just decide to select a faster mailing option. Now, let's pull out our trusty safe checklist and see how this transaction rates. The sales and services associate handled the situation well. Did the associate follow the standard procedures? She verified the addresses, check. She conducted a visual inspection of the package, check. She did the shake test, check. Next, did the associate act in a professional manner? She maintained good eye contact while talking with the customer, check. She listened to what the customer had to say, check. She let the customer finish what she was saying, check. The next step, did the associate follow up with the key question? Does a parcel contain anything liquid, fragile, perishable, or potentially hazardous? That's it. Nice job. Check. And for the last one, did the associate educate the customer? The associate explained to the customer that the package would have to go by surface. Check. The associate was dealing with an educated customer in this case. The customer had repeatedly mailed ORMD before, but the associate took the opportunity to share additional information. That deserves a double-check bonus. The first step to making a mailability decision is to determine exactly what a customer wants to mail and the quantity that they wish to send. This should be accomplished through questioning. Ask. Does the parcel contain anything liquid, fragile, perishable, or potentially hazardous? If the customer states no, and the parcel passes the visual inspection and the shake test, then continue with this acceptance process. If the customer identifies the contents, what references are available to assist you? The Postal Service's requirements for mailing hazardous materials are published in the Domestic Mail Manual, DMM, Publication 52, 
and the International Mail Manual, IMM. The DMM is the primary resource for determining the mailability of hazardous materials. The DMM is published every six months. Occasional updates are provided in the Postal Bulletin. Section C023 of the DMM presents hazardous materials mailability information in a technical form and requires specific information about the material being mailed. Publication 52 is also a useful guide to determine mailability. The primary advantage of Publication 52 is that Appendix A presents a table of commonly mailed items listed by name, including a summary of mailability and other information about each item. Keep in mind that it is not updated as frequently as the DMM. Any mailability decisions reached using Publication 52 must be double-checked in the DMM to ensure that they're correct. The mailability of hazardous materials to foreign addresses is extremely limited. The IMM is the main resource for determining the mailability of materials traveling to other countries. If you have utilized the available references and still can't determine if the item is mailable, what do you do? Do not accept the item. In addition to the DMM, IMM, and Publication 52, the following materials are available to assist you. Poster 298, Poster 81, Handbook EL812, and Notice 107. If the customer needs more extensive information, they may contact the Rates and Classification Service Centers, which can be found in Notice 107. Once you have verified that a hazardous material parcel is acceptable and have properly accepted it into the mail stream, there are specific handling requirements that must be met. Hazardous materials must be segregated from one another and from other mail. Do not commingle hazmat mail with other mail. There is the potential that if these packages were to break open, they could react with one another or damage other mail. Hazardous materials must be stored on a reliable container where they will not be crushed or lose their identity. Do not place hazmat in cardboard gaylords, canvas hampers, or postal packs. Once hazmat has been placed on an acceptable container, such as a GPMC, the container must be placarded indicating the presence of hazmat. Hazmat must always be handled manually. Under no circumstances should a hazmat package be placed on mechanized equipment. These requirements are in place to prevent hazardous materials parcels from being damaged during transit or sorting, and to protect employees in downline facilities from encountering hazardous materials packages unexpectedly. <laughs> I hope that you found the hazardous materials training that we've provided to be useful. Please apply these procedures to each appropriate transaction. Make sure you do your part to make the Postal Service a safer place to work. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I uh, want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite products, and that is uh, Priority Mail. In fact, uh, when this is over with, we'll be asking you what your priority is, because it's a very big deal out there. But before we get into the product itself, let's talk about a couple of things that should get us to that point. First of all, when customers greet us at the counter, what kind of faces should they see when they come to the counter? Just show me. That's right. That's uh, pretty much it there, sir. We'll work on that. But here's the point. <laughs> A pleasant, positive greeting is a way to greet any customer. And then there's these questions that we want to make sure we ask of customers. And the very first one is probably the most important question, and it has to do with when this article needs to arrive. In fact, there's about a million different ways to say it. Is there a deadline for delivery? Does it need to be there by a certain day? Some of you just say, when does it need to get there? In fact, when does it need to get there is a pretty easy way to say it. On the count of three, let's see how we do with that, okay? One, two, three. When does it need to get there? Now, have you ever asked that question and the customer says, the cheapest way. Yes, yes. 
So you did this beautiful question to go, cheapest way possible. Just cheapest, strap it on this up, I don't care what happens, okay? Well, when they're talking about that, a lot of times what they're talking about is uh, standard A or standard B, depending on how heavy the mail is. But one of the beautiful things about the way to pre you can present priority mail to customers has to do with that thing I call, and you call, that extra nickel. That, in fact, I call it the famous extra nickel. Does everybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about the famous extra nickel? Now, here's what's cool about the famous extra nickel. A lot of times the customer will say, well, hey, you can send it priority for another nickel. And the customer says, well, what do I get? And a lot of folks will say, well, faster service. But there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? That extra nickel has a whole lot. Here's what I learned you get for another nickel. Watch this. Uh, in fact, I'd like you to ask me on the count of three, what do you get for an extra nickel? You're going to be the customer, okay? And then I'm going to tell you, okay? On the count of three, one, two, three. What do you get for the extra nickel? Well, for an extra nickel, you get faster service, better handling, free tape, stickers, boxes, envelopes, labels, free return, free forwarding, and the impact of the priority mail image. You all like that? Let me do that one more time because I liked it too. <laughs> For another nickel, you get faster service, less handling, free tape, stickers, boxes, envelopes, labels, free return, free forwarding, and the impact of the priority mail image. All for another five cents. Now let's look at those things because they're all significant. The first one, faster service. If the customer is giving you any indication that time is an issue for them, priority mail obviously should be one of those things that starts ringing a bell for you, right? Because uh, oftentimes two to three days versus what may be seven, eight, or nine days with uh, formal parcel post, standard A, standard B, that stuff. Well, then you have that uh, less handling thing. Uh, and a lot of people are not aware, a lot of customers are not aware that priority mail is handled differently and goes through a different system of channels to be delivered than the other stuff does. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever worked in... Um, uh, at, the, at what I call the big place, you know, with the plant where you worked in mail processing. But if you've ever done that, you know that uh, standard mail gets handled a little differently than the other. St I can't really get into the details of how differently in many cases, but are, nod at me if you know what I'm talking about there. It's a little different. It doesn't move as far between people touching it, you know, as other things do, okay? Now, is that important possibly for a customer? Sure, especially if what they're sending to someone is something that they would like to arrive in good condition or better condition to get the best possible handling. So faster service, less handling. Then you get all the free stuff. There's a lot of free stuff. Mm -hmm. Tapes, stickers, boxes, envelopes, labels. You can get them at the post office. They can call an 800 number and get this stuff. They can order this stuff through the internet via the postal service website. Get as much as you want. As a matter of fact, I'm one of those customers that you probably love nowadays because I don't use any products, any packaging off your shelves in the post office anymore. How do y'all feel about that? I'll leave it up. That's right. Give it up for me. There you go. I get my stuff. I order my stuff via the web, and I have it delivered directly to me. So I can use your products and services without coming in line and raking all of them off your shelves, and you still get the benefit of the money for it. Uh, by the way, this whole thing about all this free stuff is important because it helps identify the mail as it moves through the process. And as uh, those of you who work behind the window or work with customers at the window, that's a very big job for you too, to make sure that things are identified properly. I don't know if you've ever seen the process, but people don't necessarily examine every side of a box at the plant before it goes in this bin with priority or this bin with uh, the standard mail. So when you're doing, how many sides does a box have, for example? Gotcha, it's six sides. <laughs> Six sides, thinking square. There's people going, wait a minute. One and then, so stay with me. It's not a long tape, sir. We got to keep rolling. But six sides. Uh, a lot of times, customers will send something. They want to send it first class, but it's over 13 ounces, which by default makes it what? Priority, Priority mail. And so we have to avoid the temptation of just putting the sticker there that says, you know, the little PVI thing there. We have to make sure that we put something on each side of the box, give it every chance to be handled correctly all the way down the line, okay? By the way, it also sends a message, this priority mail thing, doesn't it? Uh, when people see priority on a package, does that mean something when you receive it? We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, about how that can really be a big selling point for priority mail. But let's get back to free return and free forwarding. A lot of customers think that everything is free return and free forwarding, unless they are told differently. In fact, just by saying that the way we said it a couple of moments ago, you did a lot of education for customers, because now they're wondering, oh, the other stuff wasn't then. That's right. Only the first class mail gets that kind of treatment. Is this possibly important to business customers? Yeah. That it's forwarded and that it will get to where its final destination is. In fact, it's kind of easy on the folks on the other side, too. It's, uh, they voice that little posters do conversation that can be a little crunchy from time to time. Ever seen the, anybody seen the 
Because the customer wants to know, why are you telling me this? Now, don't be telling me. Then you need to tell whoever sent it. I don't, this ain't coming out of my mouth. I tell you, that could be a very interesting time there, okay? So giving the customer that benefit of that product also gives them a much higher assurance that it's going to get where it ultimately needs to go. And then there's the impact of the priority mail image. That's a beautiful envelope, isn't it? That logo, and I just, it really sends a message. It doesn't just send the package, it sends a message with it. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I walked into a post office once, and I was just sending something across the city. And uh, I wanted to send it priority mail. Well, I think the person at the window thought they were helping me when they said, Greg, you know better than that. All you do is put a stamp on it. <laughs> I think they were thinking they were helping me. And I said, I don't want to put a stamp on it. Greg, as much training as you do, you know, you put a stamp on it, it's going, to get ring, going right down there. You know it. You can, you can follow the truck. It's going right over there. <laughs> but see, the point was not about time for me when it came to this. What this person was not aware of, and which I told her later, was that this is a bid for a contract in this envelope. And you see, I know when everybody else sends their bid to this particular client or potential client, that when those, other, those little number 10 envelopes get there and my priority mail envelope gets there, guess which one is going to be open first? Guess who's already told this client that they're a priority for me? Just by using the service. Everybody, that message is very powerful. It sends not just a package, but a message too. Now, what other kind of things about priority mail? You know, that, that famous extra nickel thing, what I've learned is that a lot of people have a very, a lot of very slick ways of getting customers to do that famous extra nickel thing. Not everybody just says it outright. Some of y'all are kind of slick about it. Let me tell you one of the ones I saw that I thought was very slick. Nearly dirty. So slick it was, you know, it was right on the borderline. You know what I mean? Almost unacceptable. I loved it though. Customer wanted to send something the cheapest way. Came up, send this the cheapest way. I don't care, just send it the cheapest way. And the clerk did something very interesting. She went up to the customer. She said, OK, I'll do that. Never went right with what the customer said, OK? Sure, we can do that for you. Of course, it's probably going to take, uh, ooh, seven, eight. I, in fact, I'm not sure exactly when it's going to get there. And she started telling the customer this. And the customer's eyes started getting real big. And then she said this, or for another nickel, I'm going to put this priority mail stuff on and give you that free stuff and it'll get there in two or three days and I'll just give it to you for another nickel. And you just think about it. Just, I'll give you the free stuff. <laughs> and she left that customer. The customer's eyes were going, oh, okay, oh, okay. Because something had just been, a point had just made to this customer that they had not been aware of before. In fact, the cool thing about this is that this customer felt like this person was really special because they were giving them an inside line that nobody else had given them before. <laughs> And you know, when you do that, some of you do other things that help customers along. For example, a great way to say thank you for using priority mail is to give them another envelope before they leave. I've seen people do that before. A customer gives you an envelope, and by the way, thank you very much. And you, get, you can go ahead and prepare this one before you come in. It'll save you some time. That's a cool thing, because not all customers understand this stuff is free or complimentary. Sometimes they act like they're getting away with stuff. Have you ever seen them act like they're getting away with stuff? You give them stuff. You know how y'all are, because you know, you're slick. You can give them stuff, and they're walking out acting like they got away with something. You'll see them going, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's going to wrestle them through the ground in a parking lot or something for taking a priority mail envelope. Oh, then we have this uh, kind of wonderful thing that people have been looking for for a long time called delivery confirmation. Mm -hmm. Boy, I tell you what, that's one of the best things the Postal Service has done in a long time, especially for that product called priority mail. In fact, you've noticed a lot of customers that only used express mail before are using priority mail now more because they have some, some uh, visibility to what's going on. One little caution to that, by the way, uh, find, we're finding a lot of customers are confused and confusing tracking and tracing with delivery confirmation. They're not the same thing, are they? No. no. One says you can go along the way and see what's going on. The other one says you'll know when it got there. And when customers make that leap, we have to make sure that we educate them on the fact that this is different so that they'll, their expectations will be in uh, touch with what they need to do going down the line. Everybody with me? Priority mail. Uh, by the way, that's, uh, the image and the product is uh, kind of a popular thing, so popular that a couple of little companies are starting to use it as a regular part of doing business. You probably never heard of them. Uh, Amazon.com is one of them, which actually is putting their logo with your logo on the priority mail stuff. Uh, a couple of other companies that probably never heard of, like Home Shopping Network, uh, Eddie Bauer, you know, the companies that are trying to, you know, trying to get their mark in the marking place now, right now. But these are pretty big companies. And what they're saying by virtue of doing this is that priority mail is important. It is a choice for a lot of e-commerce folks. In fact, uh, you're building a lot of relationships that you'll start hearing about more and more as Postal Service understands 
that uh, e-commerce is a big part of the way to go. Have you seen some of the advertisements, by the way, that are making that point, hooking up uh, the little guy walking around with the GPS satellite and the person saying, you know, I should have gotten my tie? That's a Postal Service and Amazon.com commercial. So you're starting to, to bunch resources with very powerful companies, uh, or they're starting to bunch resources with a very powerful company called the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, how about this one? Did you know that Priority Mail has a higher delivery percentage overnight in many cases than the overnight product of other companies? Especially if you think about it as a virtual overnight product. If I'm mailing it on a Friday to a business that's closed on Saturdays and Sundays, when will it be delivered typically? Monday. On that Monday. Mm -hmm. Do you know that's the same delivery standard I get with FedEx and UPS overnight service? Mm -hmm. Because they typically don't deliver on the weekends. So if you're looking for other options, I tell you, uh, we'll talk about express mail in other videos, but you think there's a price difference between your stuff and express mail. Think about that as an option for customers that virtually gives them the same thing. Now, you'll know when it's the right thing to do or not because they'll send you those little signals. If their eyes are batting real fast, maybe need to move to the other thing, okay? <laughs> But if this is part of what will work for them, there's a lot of things going on with Priority Mail that make a real big difference with customers, don't they? The famous extra nickel, the free stuff, the virtual overnight delivery, delivery confirmation. I tell you, there's a lot of stuff going on that's cool with Priority Mail. In fact, what's your priority is a question that's pretty easy to answer nowadays. I think it's Priority Mail. Thank you all so much for your time, and you go get them. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, you all still out there? Well, uh, since you're here, just want to say thanks for watching. And I know we covered a lot of information. And if you want some more information about the topic you just saw, visit the Postal website at the address you see on the screen. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Ken Weaver, Chief Postal Inspector. The mission of the Postal Inspection Service is to protect the employees, the customers, and the Postal Service from criminal attack, and also to protect the nation's mail system from criminal misuse. Part of that mission is also achieved by protecting postal revenues and striving to keep the mail crime-free. In doing so, we ensure that our customers have confidence in the U.S. mail. As a sales and services associate, you will be a partner with the Postal Inspection Service to accomplish this very important part of our mission. You are the first line of security when it comes to the retail operations of the Postal Service. When companies or individuals pay the Postal Service to move valuable documents or parcels, they put complete trust in us. They trust us with their money, their property, and their confidential communications. That trust is sacred and must be earned and nurtured with every single transaction. By paying attention to what you are about to hear and putting it into practice, you will ensure that the mail and the public money we handle on a daily basis are safe and secure. Congratulations and good luck in your new assignment as a sales and services associate. So, you're going to be a sales and services associate. Well, like they say, I've been there, done that. Even have a nice shirt to prove it. I've worked on the retail counter for years, and now I'm a lead sales and services associate. I really do enjoy the job. Of course, I still work at the retail counter, but now I get to train the future associates. You know, show them the ropes once they finish with their classroom training. It won't be long, and you will be heading out to start working on the retail counter. 
But before you get started, I'd like to share something with you that has helped me during my time as a retail associate. Not long ago, my supervisor said to me, Joyce, you're doing a really good job here. You are a person of integrity. Well, yes, of course I was flattered. I mean, integrity means honesty. But then, if she meant honest, why didn't she say honest? So, I decided to look up this word, integrity. I would like to share with you what I found. Let's see here. Okay. Integer, integrate, ah, here it is, integrity. Now, three definitions. First, strict adherence to a standard of conduct. You already know about the importance of that. Second, personal honesty. And third, completeness. Well, in a nutshell, that's what's expected of us as retail associates. Complete every transaction by the standards as thoroughly as we were trained to do. Never forget the sanctity of the mail, postal funds, and stock entrusted to us. Well, this is important stuff and something that you really need to understand. Sounds simple? Well, yes and no. A busy post office can't function with robots on automatic pilot. We deal with lots of people and they're all different. Each of them will have their own needs, and some will have questions. Our customers want service and answers to their questions, and they have the right to expect that. But when the questions are answered and they decide what they want, there is only one way to perform each transaction. Do it by the book as we were trained, every time. Of course, these things are obvious. It keeps the mail moving, minimizes losses and delays. But don't forget the flip side. Proper procedure is the only recorded proof we have that we did our job right, if there is a loss. And while we're on the subject of security, let's be more specific. You'll be dealing with a lot of cash. Cash for stamps, cash for money orders, cash for CODs, postage due, postal merchandise, and on and on. In fact, most of the transactions we complete mean receiving money from customers, postal service funds. All the equipment that you have to use and all the training that you have received is worthless unless you are willing to put it to use every day. Here's an example. This associate is leaving the retail counter and has secured the area. Fine. So far, so good. But What's this? He's accountable for those money orders. If they're gone when he returns, he's responsible. On the other hand, this efficient associate has cleared her work area and returned everything safely to her cash drawer and locks it. But, oh no, she didn't need to lock it if she wasn't going to take the key. So what's the big deal? She's only stepped away for a moment, but a moment is all it takes, and it could be a very big deal, depending on what's missing. It happens, believe me. So remember to always maintain control of your assigned keys. If your fellow employees imply you don't trust them, tell them it's the way I was taught to do things. It's not just a matter of trust, it's a matter of doing things right. Also. The funds entrusted to you are the property of the Postal Service. There is no such thing as a loan from your cash drawer. A few dollars to cover lunch until you can cash a check might be a convenience to you. But in a security-conscious environment, that loan will be regarded as embezzlement by coworkers, management, and the inspection service. While we are talking about so-called loans from your drawer, you should also know about commingling of funds. Commingling is mixing Postal Service funds with your own personal funds. The rules are clear and simple. Don't do it. 
That means there's no cashing of your own personal checks and no mixing of your own money with Postal Service funds. Earlier, I mentioned security-conscious environment. Because of the amount of cash, stamp stock, blank money orders, and merchandise, that's exactly what the retail area of any post office should be, security-conscious. I have learned that it is in my own best interest to develop a keen sense of awareness about everything that occurs within the confines of that counter area. When dealing with postal funds, remember, always do it the way you were taught. That means no loans, no borrowing, no commingling. For offices not on segmented inventory accountability, never give stamp stock or cash to another employee without documentation. Document all your stamp requisitions with a PS Form 17 stamp requisition. If you feel a procedure is incorrect, discuss it with your supervisor, your training instructor, or an inspector. And if one sales and services associate gets sloppy about following procedures, well, it could reflect on all of us. The Postal Service provides us with preventive means in dealing with situations like these the postal inspectors. But in order to provide us that protection, they need our help. The duty of a postal inspector is to make sure that nothing happens to the mail and postal funds. And they also help ensure that valuables being sent through the mails are being delivered. If there are any violations of procedures or laws, I want the inspection service to know about it. I count on them, because I can't. No. I won't deal with a thief. I won't be a fall guy, and neither should you. And if it means talking to one of the inspectors about trouble on my shift, well, that's what I have to do. Well, that said, let's move on to a more positive subject, and that is the sanctity of the mail. Every piece of mail, every package entrusted to us is an expression of confidence by the public that we can deliver. If they're important documents and valuable items, postal customers pay a premium for our added attention and security. For records, to monitor the movement of articles until safely delivered. Registered mail, certified mail, and insured items all require a receipt to the customer. All documentation is initiated by us, the sales and services associates, before the process of delivery can begin. Following postal procedure completely and thoroughly is critical at this point for two reasons. Obviously, to ensure safe delivery of the item, and in the event of loss, to track the piece down. But if during an investigation the lost piece of accountable mail we're unable to show that we followed the correct procedures, well, someone is going to have a lot of explaining to do. So for our own protection, it is important that we do it by the book, as we were trained, every time. As a retail associate, you will be entrusted with money and other accountable items. Postal Service policies and regulations require you to handle these items with care to protect Postal Service funds. In the handling of money orders, there are three basic areas of concern. Securing them, selling them, and cashing them. Money orders should be secured like all accountable items. It helps me to think of them as cash. When selling money orders, pay close attention during every transaction, and then you won't have any problems. Keep your eyes open for something like this. One person buying multiple money orders in low denominations. Altering low value money orders to a higher value is one of the oldest tricks in the book. And somebody always thinks they're original and they may want to try it. So make a note of the person and tell your supervisor about it. PS Form 8105B, Suspicious Transaction Report, should be completed by you. Be sure to keep all money orders you are selling to a customer out of their reach. Customers have snatched money orders from sales and service associates' hands or the top of counter lines and fled without paying. 
you could be held financially liable for the loss if you are found to be careless or negligent. As long as we are talking about security, there is something new to keep in mind. With all the new computer technologies that are out there, counterfeiting is on the rise. Criminals who make counterfeit currency are then coming to post offices and passing the bogus bills in exchange for Postal Service money orders. So be extra careful when accepting cash for money orders. The best method of detecting a counterfeit bill is to compare the suspect bill with a genuine bill of the same denomination and series. Look for differences, not similarities. The printing on counterfeit bills will appear flat and lack the three-dimensional quality of genuine bills. The lines in the portrait background, if you look closely, form squares. The portrait on the bill should correspond with the denomination. You can hold the bill up to a light and a watermark of the portrait should also appear on the bill. If you are suspicious of a bill, complete PS form 8105B, Suspicious Transaction Report, and notify your supervisor. If your office has surveillance equipment, you should make sure it's activated to document the transaction. Place the suspected counterfeit currency in an envelope to prevent unnecessary handling and give the bill to your supervisor. The supervisor should immediately contact the inspection service. You also need to be aware of individuals purchasing multiple money orders using a debit card. Debit cards are like cash. They can be taken to a bank to make a cash advance or withdrawal. Make sure the transaction makes sense. And, if in doubt, request identification to help ensure the legitimacy of the transaction. If you feel this is a suspicious transaction, go ahead and document the information on PS Form 8105B, Suspicious Transaction Report, and notify your supervisor. The supervisor will provide a copy of this report to the inspection service. You should always have three bait money orders in your cash drawer under the high denomination bills. In the unlikely event of a robbery, hand over these bait items along with any other cash or stock the robber demands. This will assist in tracking the criminal. Of course, you should never do anything during a robbery that might endanger yourself or others. Some offices use hold-up cameras activated by money clip transmitters. Some offices are equipped with hold-up systems activated by other methods. If your office is equipped with a hold-up alarm system, you should fully understand how to operate the system. Some offices are equipped with bullet-resistant screen lines to reduce the risk of a robbery. These offices require special acceptance procedures for oversized parcels. Follow office procedures for the acceptance of oversized parcels and do not allow the customer access to unprotected areas. When you cash a money order, follow procedure. Follow procedure. Follow procedure. Check for tampering, forgery, or counterfeiting. With today's home computers, anyone with time and ingenuity can reproduce anything. Counterfeit money orders can look very real. Protect yourself and the Postal Service by asking for proper identification. Check the money order thoroughly. Hold the money order up to the light to verify the watermark. Also, look for the silver band which runs either vertically or horizontally. Compare the signature on the identification to the signature the customer wrote and always check the number of the money order against the list of missing money orders in the postal bulletin. If the money order is on the list, don't cash it. Activate any surveillance equipment in your office to document the transaction. Make up some excuse why you have to leave your window. Maybe, excuse me for a moment, I have to go back to get some more money to cash this money order. Take the questionable money order and the person's identification with you. Notify your supervisor and explain that someone is trying to cash a stolen money order. Complete PS Form 8105B, Suspicious Transaction Report. Provide the report 
along with a questionable money order and the person's identification to your supervisor. Your supervisor will assist you from here. As sales and services associates, we're called upon to provide a wide variety of services to the public. And even though you'll serve many customers every day, remember to always follow proper procedures. Make all entries and attend to all accounting immediately. Then you can avoid the stress of working with a drawer in chaos, and you'll be able to close out according to procedures. The formula for success as a sales and services associate is simple. Are you ready? Do it by the book, as we were trained, every time. Our training includes every detail of what is expected of us in performing our duties. One of your responsibilities as a sales and services associate is to prevent criminals from profiting from our business. A growing problem is the use of stolen, counterfeit, or out-of-state checks to purchase multiple coils of stamps. If a customer asks to purchase multiple coils of stamps, stop and think if the transaction makes sense. How many stamps can an individual use at one time? Certainly not 5, 10, or 20 coils. The customer may even present a business check. Do you know this customer? Normally, companies that do a lot of mailings use a postage meter. To protect yourself and the Postal Service, always ask for identification and verify that the information matches. If you feel the transaction is suspicious, ask the customer to wait while you check if you have enough coils. Take the check and identification and make a photocopy of them. Activate a camera, if available, to track the transaction. Once the customer leaves, complete PS Form 8105B, Suspicious Transaction Report. Notify your supervisor and give all documentation to your supervisor for the inspection service. Here's something else. It is very important for every employee to strive to work in a secure, safe, and crime-free environment. The inspection service is deeply involved in two areas that directly impact us as postal employees. These are drug use by employees and workers' compensation fraud. Drug abuse, or the sale of narcotics, is not tolerated in our workforce and may be subject to criminal investigation. The Postal Service has established an employee assistance program to help employees and their immediate families in dealing with problems, including substance abuse. The U.S. Postal Service has a workers' compensation program that is administered by the U.S. Department of Labor. This is a valuable benefit that assures we as employees are provided for while recovering from injuries we may sustain on the job. The abuse of the program has made it necessary for the inspection service to investigate the legitimacy of claims and activities of postal employees subsequent to their filing of claims. A false injury claim is a crime and is prosecuted under federal statutes. It is every employee's responsibility to report criminal acts of which they become aware in the course of their employment. The failure to report an offense is covered in the U.S. Code under misprisonment of a felony and constitutes an offense. All the efforts of postal inspectors are directed toward protecting the employees, the postal service, and the customers we serve. From recording our time to completing financial forms, they are all important. Do it by the numbers. Enter every sale at the time of the sale and give every customer a system-generated receipt. So you see, Webster's captures us in a nutshell. First, strict adherence to a standard of conduct. Second, personal honesty. And the third definition, completeness. Well, I have to get going. Good luck. You're going to do just fine. I'll be seeing you around.
Hello. Okay. Let's talk product a little bit. In fact, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit because we're going to talk about a product that, uh, when used best, it gives a, a customer a real good chance to express themselves. <laughs> Y'all are so quick. You know which one I'm talking about, don't you? We're talking about Express Mail, uh, the U.S. Postal Service's guaranteed overnight service. That's, let's talk a little bit about that. In fact, uh, when you greet those customers with those bright, beautiful smiles and that professional greeting, you know the one I'm talking about. Where is it? Let me see it. There you go. When you greet them that way uh, and you start finding out what they need, that first question that we're asking to try to shave this thing down and make sure we're right on target is when, do you, when does it need to get there? When do you need this to arrive? What, is there a deadline for delivery? Simply put, many people just say, when does it need to get there? In fact, would you please ask me that on the count of three? One, two, three. When does it need to get there? Have I had a customer say this? Yesterday. <laughs> it's like yesterday. In fact, the Postal Service is presently working on a product called Yesterday. And uh, while it's not been developed fully yet, we understand you'll be able to charge whatever you want for it uh, when people come in. Uh, sometimes customers, you can tell uh, when express mail is going to be an issue because there's a little different body language. You know, it's, there's more of a sense of urgency. In fact, you'll say, when does it need to get there? And I've heard people will say things like this to you. Look, I don't care what it takes. I don't care how much it costs. It's got to be in New York tomorrow, no matter what. And some of you will say... Well, that'll be $800. I'm leaving right now. Thank you very much. I see. I'll call you when I get up, that kind of thing. But there is a sense of urgency when it comes to express mail. This is something that time is not just important. It's getting to a critical point. Now, a couple of things about express mail uh, and overnight, and I think uh, especially for those of you who are watching that are moving into the realm of being uh, sales and service associates, is remember, it's not always overnight. Uh, oftentimes, it's two days. Now, that is not necessarily bad news to a customer. Let me tell you what could make it bad news, is if there's a two-day option and the customer never finds out about it. It may look like this. Well, can you send it overnight? No. <laughs> there's a little vacuum there, isn't it? But a lot of times, customers will tell us later, after they've been through the process, that they wish someone would have told them it was two days. They may have still gotten it if it were two days, but they never knew because, literally, it wasn't overnight. So make sure you, your customers know what their options are and let your customers decide, because that's who's really the decision really rests with anyway. A uh, couple other things about Express Mail that I think are very cool. Of course, you get free stuff with Express Mail. Get free stuff. Get insurance. Insurance up to $500, right? In fact, you can even buy more insurance if you want it nowadays. It's a very cool thing. So there's a process there that customers feel that this is a package deal with this uh, thing. You know, and that kind of matches because if it's critical in terms of time, it's nice to be able to have other things that kind of say that this is important to the way we're going to handle it here too. Uh, how about uh, this little thing called waiver signature? I have been working with this a while and been listening and talking to a lot of you for a long time, and I have not ever heard one good reason ever why a customer should not be told about waiver of signature when they're sending a piece of express mail. Never one time have I ever heard a case where it's appropriate not to say it, except if the customer says, I want to do that waiver of signature, at which point it might seem a little light upstairs if you keep talking about it and they just asked for it already. Waiver of signature gives the Postal Service and the customer so much more flexibility. And one of the things it does is it eliminates or at least reduces what I call the express mail yellow slip shuffle. I bet if I give you a chance to think about that for a minute, you know what the express mail yellow slip shuffle is. Because a lot of customers don't know there's a second delivery attempt. And you know what happens. They're not there. Somebody sent it. But they didn't choose waiver of signature for whatever reason. Customer gets home that evening. They open the box. There's a yellow slip there. Well, the customer says, well, that's OK. I'll just go over to the post office tomorrow and get it around lunchtime. <laughs> so they come back in around lunchtime. They say, well, I'm here to get the thing. And you say, well, the thing is gone again because the carrier's got the thing. So they are okay, well, good. I'll just run back by the house before I go back to work. They go back to the house. They look in the mailbox. What's another yellow slip? <laughs> and now they come back to the office, and they're taking the rest of the day off. They're like, I'm not leaving. I know it's around here somewhere. Y'all stop hiding the thing now because I know the thing is in there. A lot of that could be eliminated if the customer knew two things. One, about waiver of signature. Two, that there's a second delivery attempt. Those little things make a big difference with customers. In fact, a lot of you have um, not only mentioned it to customers, which I think is brilliant, but you also make sure you help the rest of the process out by doing things like highlighting the envelope or putting stickers on the envelope. You've got the one, the carrier, deliver if no response. A lot of things that you can do and say to people down the mail line that can also honor and respect uh, a waiver of signature. Big deal, waiver of signature. Another big deal, but not very often spoken of, is this no weekend holiday delivery option. 
the no weekend holiday delivery option is could be one of the least spoken of features of express mail but it could be one of the most valuable depending on what the customers needs are let me paint a picture here for you i'm a customer of yours that uh... the mortgage company my mortgage company has called me as many times as they really want to call me okay this pretty much is the last call i'm getting from the mortgage company it's friday morning and pretty much if my check ain't there on monday uh, I can find some place for my sofa somewhere along the curb. You know what I mean there? Uh, now, not, I don't know this experience personally because I've never gone through this. Anyway, <laughs> they get a little feisty with you when that last call is being made. Well, let's say I go to the post office. and I'm, This is, this is it's, by the way, is this critical here? This is, when's it need to get there? Yesterday. This is that one, okay? And uh, you say, well, what, let, express mail is your best bet. Well, they send it, but they don't send it with the no weekend holiday del delivery option, checked and signed, by the way, because you have to sign that in addition to checking. Just can't check it, check and sign. And they're sending it to the mortgage company. And uh, the mortgage company is closed on Saturdays and Sundays. So when that mortgage company person gets there on Monday, they're not going to have my check. Guess what they're going to have? A little yellow slip. And that check that was keeping my stuff from being on the street is now floating around doing the yellow slip shuffle and somehow, I know the mortgage company is not going to stop their whole life to look for my check when it could have been right there in their hands if we know, kind of think about the fact that this is a Friday. Is it important for this not to be delivered until Monday? Um, that becomes a key thing. So with waiver of signature, make sure you offer that to everybody. If they don't take it, whose choice is it? Theirs, but let it be their choice. No weekend holiday delivery option, especially on Fridays or especially during some times of year, because there's a lot of holidays that a lot of people celebrate that th stuff's going to banks and other places. We've got to be mindful of that so we make sure the customer's mail has every chance to get there when we promised it would. Okay? Now, there's another thing tracking and tracing. One of the cool things about the Postal Service and Express Mail is tracking and tracing. You know, you can call the 800 number and track and trace it, you can do it on the web. I don't know if you've ever done it on the web. It's cool on the web. I, I track and trace my stuff even when it's there already because I like to see what, because it has a little thing on the web that says, see what happened earlier. Have you seen that? If you go on the web, it says, see what happened earlier. I just want to know what happened earlier. It's there. I just want to see what happened earlier. So I just click there and look at what happened earlier. That's a very cool thing. It gives customers a lot more feeling of a sense of control. But making sure customers know that they can track and trace it might also reduce the amount of time they spend in line. What do you think? Because a lot of people come into the post office and wait to ask you, is it there? I've heard a couple of great ideas on this, not just introducing it uh, and telling them about their ability to track and trace it on their own, but uh, one person told me about the suggestion they make, which is to take the little sticker, you know, that comes off the, that has a little tracking sticker, and tell the customer to put this in your daytime or planner on that date when we promised it would be there. So the customer automatically, when they look there, they have that reminder right there to look and call, got the tracking number and everything, without having to go through a lot of gyrations about what was that number, where's that slip, that kind of thing. And speaking of customer copy, we want to tell these customers to keep that customer copy, don't we, with express mail. Nothing is quite as dark a day as a customer that comes in to track and trace a piece of express mail with a cash receipt. That's a dark day for a customer, especially if they run into the king or queen of ease of use that day. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about when I say the king or queen of ease of use. This person comes in, I want to track and trace uh, my uh, piece of express mail. Uh, what do you have? Do you have your, yeah? And they hold up that little piece of paper and they run into the king or queen of ease of use. This is what might happen. <laughs> oh, Fred. Come here, Fred. Wait, show Fred. Show Fred. Y'all kill me with that. I tell you, you customers are crazy. Everybody with me? That can be a little bit of a humiliating time for a customer. So make sure that if they get a cash receipt, sure, hold on to that. But the key document is that customer copy. In fact, a lot of people even go the extra mile and round date that copy for customers because a lot of times the impressions through the carbon don't show as clearly what's going on. So the customer has a clear idea exactly what was going on. Perfect, great ideas. Everybody with me? Little things that make this product so much more easy for the postal service and for the customer. There's another couple of things about express mail that I think are important too, and they have to do with you keeping your antenna up and watching certain activities because maybe some of you have noticed that from time to time you have a customer that may come in three, four, five times a week sending express mail. Uh, that should send up a little red flag to say, wait a minute, this person sending this much express mail, maybe they should have an express mail corporate account. 
Uh, is there a benefit to them having an Express Mail corporate account? Oh, yeah. Look at some of the things. Obviously, first of all, it saves them a little time because the envelope, the labels are pre-printed, so a lot of that stuff's already on there. They don't have to worry about supplies. They get all the supplies they want. They get a statement that tells them how much their postage is. Get this. They will never, if they have an, a corporate account, uh, Express Mail corporate account, never put the wrong amount of postage on Express Mail ever again because they don't even have to worry about weighing it because it's taken care of by the process. Cool? I think that's very cool. In fact, uh, a lot of these customers that send a lot of Express Mail like that are business customers. And uh, legend has it, uh, that, and when you hear me say legend has it, that means it's something I've heard from a minimum of 10,000 postal employees. When you hear 10,000 people say it, there's something to it. Legend has it that a lot of these customers tend to come in, the business customers tend to come in the worst three times a day. Opening, lunch, and about 30 seconds before closing. When they're waiting in very long what? Lines. Is it possible that that in and of itself might encourage me to use someone else's overnight service if I think it has to be that labor intensive? Because when people do that, they think they have to come in to the post office to do it when they don't. In fact, they can buy express mail postage, can't they? You better believe it. So there's a lot of different ways for customers to use this product, shorten your lines, shorten their amount of time, and also make accounting and everything a lot easier for them. So we're talking about uh, that waiver of signature. We're talking about the no weekend holiday delivery option. We're talking about the insurance. By the way, everybody knows. I'll just tell you because I know you know anyway. But if you buy supplemental insurance, no more waiver of signature. Everybody aware of that, right? You start getting over that amount, then waiver of signature is out the window. But up to 500, you're still in good shape corporate accounts, selling the postage ahead of time, and just making sure that customers know that Express Mail is just not overnight service. It's a feature-rich product that has a lot of applications that can make their life easier and make your life easier, too. So uh, help your customers express themselves with Express Mail, okay? Thank you very much for your time. Y'all go get them. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, you all still out there? Well, uh, since you're here, just want to say thanks for watching. And I know we covered a lot of information. And if you want some more information about the topic you just saw, visit the Postal website at the address you see on the screen. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. Welcome, welcome to the class. Excellent service every customer every time. We're going to be talking today about customer service and uh, customer service is kind of a weird thing to talk about. But you know, interesting thing about customer service is sometimes those of us who work in customer service forget that we also play another role sometimes. And that role is as what, do you think? Customer. Well, let me ask you this. I uh, just want to talk to you about the service that you get for a few minutes. Before we talk about postal service, customer service, how many of you have spent some money somewhere in the last three days by a show of hands? Some money somewhere in the last three days. Okay, all right. Okay, now here's a question for you. When you spent that hard earned money the last three days, how many of you got in return for the money you spent a level of customer service that was so dynamic and top notch that everything that company did proved to you in the last three days how important you were as a customer? If you had that experience, let me know by raising your hand. Okay, well maybe three days is too short. Maybe we better go for two weeks now. And I don't mean a dollar's worth of service for a dollar that you spend. I mean above and beyond the Call of Duty customer service. Now in the last two weeks now, if you've had above and beyond the Call of Duty customer service, let me see you raise your hand. Last two weeks. Okay, we're up to uh, three people. <laughs> the rest of you looking at me as if to say, keep going. And I sense that, I feel that, so let's go to one more level. The last 90 days here, we're talking about the last three months where somebody blew you away with customer service. If that's you. Wow, we're up to eight people. Now, a lot of you have not raised your hands yet. Could all the rest of you who have not yet raised your hands, could you all raise your hands now, all the rest of you all? Look at that. Nearly 80% of the room can now remember a dynamic customer service experience. Get this, in the last quarter of a year. How about that, last quarter of a year. Now, is there something wrong with that, customers? Does your money deserve more than it's getting out there? What do you think? Believe so? Well, let me ask you this question. Well, actually, let me tell you a question I've asked some of your coworkers across the country. I've asked postal employees, think like customers and tell me why you're not getting excellent service when you go to spend your money. What's getting in the way of it? I hear very interesting things from you and your coworkers. I hear attitude, like oftentimes you walk into a place and get the distinct impression that you're interrupting things when you go in there. You ever had that feeling before? Or more work, fewer people? Now, you all can't really relate to that in the postal service, can you, that more work? 
Oh, that's right, U.S. Postal Service, gotcha, that's right. Right, wrong crowd, okay. How about, um, have you ever spent money someplace and got an impression that they didn't really know what they were selling you? Like there was not enough knowledge there to support you in terms of customer service? And even though it wasn't a bad attitude, it came across as something less than what we want? Well, I want to throw something into the mix that may seem kind of weird. I think customers, we have a direct responsibility in the level of customer service we receive sometimes. I think we cause ourselves to get bad service. And you know how? I think a lot of times we get bad customer service, and you know what we do? We put up with it. What do you think? I'm not saying we like it, but we tolerate it. And think about this. If you give your money to somebody consistently, and they consistently give you poor service in return, are they going to do anything to make you feel better about coming there? What do you think? There's no incentive to. Well, I know I deal with bad customer service, and I don't all, I'm not always proud of it. I just know that sometimes I have to, because I have this little boss at home that's about that tall. Her name's Danielle. She's five years old. How many of you have kids? If you got kids, raise your hand. OK, all right. Well, been around kids? OK, were a kid at some point in time in your life? There are some of hands that have not gone up. OK, well, you know if you've got kids or you've been around them, you can do the simplest little things to make them thrill. One of the things I can do that absolutely thrills Danielle is to buy her a Happy Meal. But have you noticed the experience you go through to get a Happy Meal sometime? Let me give you another example. When you're out there shopping, have you seen the odd things that happen to you when you're trying to get customer service? Now, I've been to one of those stores not long ago. You know these mega stores that have 90 aisles. You know these huge stores, and you know the name of the store is not important, Walmart. And I went into the store, <laughs> and uh, watch what happened to me. First of all, I went and got into the express lane. Now, here's one for you. The express lane, where have you noticed the slowest people in every store you've ever set foot in working? The express lane. How about that? It works like that. Every, and when you get to the express lane register, here's what you see, folks. It's like this. All right, let's see. All right. Okay. All right. Beep. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay. Wait. Let's take a look at this here. Okay. Let's see. All right. Okay. Beep. <laughs> I'm new. Go down to 15 somewhere and be new. You know. Bring the flash back down to this register. Isn't that what we asked for? You know. And here's another thing. Corporate commitments on customer service. Have you ever noticed that a company committing something to you that doesn't do it kind of upsets you even more if they don't say they're going to do it? Here's a good example. If there's more than three people in an aisle, what will they do? Open another register. How many of you have seen that happen voluntarily by a show of hands? Voluntarily. OK, a couple of people. And Gus, I'd like to believe that it really did happen voluntarily, but I know what happened. Walter went over there. You know how it goes. Because some of us customer service people, when we see four people, we're like, OK, let's fix it. Because you know that's how we are. That's why nobody wants to go out with us anymore. You know how we customer service people are. Well, they usually call Bobby out of the back, you know, for the other register. They, uh, Bobby, come to register three, please. Bobby, come to register three. Have you ever seen Bobby come out of the back, how excited he comes out of the back? Here comes Bobby out of the back. Watch this. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? Jack back there doing nothing. I'm trying to eat a sandwich. They, every time they want to call on me. OK. Come on now. If y'all coming, let's go now. That's Bobby talking to you customers. He's so thrilled that you made it in there. That Bobby's excited, isn't he? I tell you. But you know, Bobby's forgotten something. You know that um, sandwich that Bobby was eating that got interrupted, that lunch? The one that he bought with the money that he gets from the paycheck that he gets from the company that he works for that can only give him one because every once in a while, aisle number three does have to open up? See, Bobby doesn't connect his job to a customer like that. Bobby's like a lot of people who treat their jobs like a birthright. You know anybody like that that treats their job like a birthright? You look at them and say, why do you have a job? <laughs> Woke up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have you noticed that, by the way, looking at news and stuff, that nobody out there has a job by birthright anymore? Not even the US Postal Service? Everybody's got to earn it nowadays? Well, I want you to know that something odd this day happened. They didn't call Bobby out of the back. A lady just mysteriously came out of the back and went over to register number three. And we were all expecting, all 80 of us in the express lane were expecting her to pull that little chain and say, you know, she was open. But she didn't do that. She reached into her pocket and pulled out an emery board and started filing her nails right there at all number three. And you know that hot, cold flash thing that happens to us when we see there's something, you know, we start getting upset, we don't know how to control it. And I say, ma'am, are you going to open that register? She said, in three minutes. <laughs> You've been there before. And you say, ma'am, your store says if there's more than three people in the aisle, you'll open it up right now. And all 500 of us over here want you to do that right now. I want you to know she responded with powerful customer service. She did. She reached up and grabbed that little chain. And yanked that chain like that box number three was shaking, just like this, yeah. It was on now, right? Now I've got to go. And now I'm scared. <laughs> because I have crossed the line with this lady. I know I'm pushing my car going, oh, man. You know? And I get over there, and I put my little items up on the counter, and the lady moves our relationship to the next level. This is the service we get. 
I put my items on the, on the counter, and she begins to power swipe my items. Have you seen power swiping before? It's an ugly thing, folks. They grab that package like that in their hand, they go, beep, boom, beep, boom, beep, boom. And you know how I go, and trying to figure out what we did to provoke it, and then you do something that you know you ought to apologize for, because you're constantly doing it. Some of y'all walk around in the store for an hour and a half, come all the way to the front with something with no price tag on it. Oh, why do you do that when you know how mad it makes them? They say the same thing to you every time. You couldn't find one with a tag on it. <laughs> like it's your job, right, to go rustling through their entire inventory to find something, and sometimes they'll try to send you back there. Go get one with a tag on it. I don't think so. I, the reason I picked this one up is because I thought this one was free. That's why I got this one in the first place. As a matter of fact, you know, if it doesn't have all the barcodes and everything on it, you can get past all the security. And I don't know that personally now. I don't know that personally, <laughs> but I've got a cousin doing three to five, but that's not for us to talk about here. But you know, the problem with you bringing that thing up there with no price tag on it is that somebody has to work now. You know, and some people, that's a, that job is no longer a good deal when you've got to work. You know, because you think about it, job's a good deal. You go in there every day, what do they give you every two weeks? Seems like just for showing up, every two weeks, what do you get? A check. But you tell some people they got to work when they get there, they'll say, <laughs> we didn't discuss this. That's going to be some more money. <laughs> I'm already using my own car, my own gas, you know what I'm saying, to come in here. Well, they have to do a price check, and you can hear the attitude. It's like this. Price check on register three, please. Price check on register three. Have you ever heard the tone of voice that they use? It's because here's what they're really saying. Another idiot made it to the front of the store with no price tag, holding up the whole dog thing for everybody, you know? They even make the little idiot light flash when you're up there. Have you ever seen that little idiot light flash? You didn't know that's what they were doing to you, folks. You got to be careful about this. Well, you know, she typed it in, and she had to manually type it in, and she slammed it in the bag. I said, okay, that's it, you know, because I was fed up now, you know. And I looked at her, and I said something that usually gets you an inter interesting response, a question. I said, you having a bad day? <laughs> Have you ever asked them if they're having a bad day? Well, she responded in a very interesting way. This is going to be kind of loud, so. No, I am not. I mean, her head was all, you know, the, no, I am not, she said. I said, well, then. <laughs> Maybe you better notify your face. <laughs> I know that makes you nervous for me to say that, because you say, oh, you wouldn't say that. Well, yes, I did say that. But haven't they just about driven you to that point, too? Because something in our minds one, at some point in time says this, I worked hard for this money. I'm not going to work hard to give it to somebody. Doesn't that make sense? Because the working for, you know, doesn't everybody want money? Giving money to people ought to be the easiest thing on earth. Every time you ought to take out a money, you should see people jumping through hoops. That's what customers think. But you know, that wasn't what happened. And by the way, she didn't strike me when I said that, but she did move our relationship to the next level. Yeah, there's another level. <laughs> it went to therapy level. Now, here's therapy level. <laughs> I'm so sorry, service. See, you just don't understand what's going on with me. See, I got a lot of things happening. See, I got a boss over here riding my back. Some lady over here told me I stole her change. Some lady, you know, I can't get my kids to go to school. I was like, oh, good. Share that. Share that with me. Because you know what? I didn't come in here to get these stocks. No, no. The reason I came in, because I ran out of personal problems. And I need to pick up a few. So could you talk a little bit more slowly so I can pick yours up? You know, because goodness knows I hate to be without a personal problem. The customers care about all that stuff. What do you think? What do you think? They could care less. But you know, the reason we bring that up is because, you know, it's a lot of serious stuff going on behind the counters where some of you work. <laughs> wasn't supposed to say that, was it? Oh, that wasn't the company line? Well, uh, can I ask your permission on something? Actually, I ask on behalf of the entire program. Is it okay if we talk to you like adults this afternoon or this morning? You know what I mean? Take away all the theoretical mumbo jumbo that is mixed into these classes a lot of times. You know all the fluff and window dressing that makes you think when you leave you had no idea what you're supposed to get out of it? Because people were dodging the issues and never said them and that insults your intelligence and that kind of stuff. What do you think? Can we just talk to you like real people for a little while? Absolutely. And let's talk about you uh, as real people. Just an interesting thing, because in terms of perceptions, and we'll talk about perceptions for a second, were you aware that out there in the general marketplace that there are some not so positive perceptions of the US Postal Service? I mean, here and there, not your post office, but you know all the other <laughs> post offices? I want you to know that I've been uh, in many cities, dozens of cities, and every time I get to a city, I run into this conversation. Interesting. Uh, it's a cab driver, somebody says, oh, uh, so you uh, new to this area? Uh, no, this is my first time. Oh, you're here on business or is this personal stuff? <laughs> you know, it's business. What kind of business are you in exactly? 
Well, I do seminars on customer service and team building, leadership, those kind of things. Oh, ooh. in front of a lot of people? Yeah, a lot of people. They go, ooh, I don't think I could do that. See, they know by saying that, that's $3 in tip right there. I'll just go ahead and give them the $3. When the people earn the tip, give it to them on the spot. They work better that way. And then they say this, uh, well, who's coming to your seminar on customer service? And I say, United States Postal Service. I want you to know, from New York to Los Angeles, from Chicago to Miami, from Houston to Honolulu, Hawaii, guess what customers say when I tell them the U.S. Postal Service is coming to a seminar on customer service? They go, oh, right, yes, and they get all personal. They say, I hope you get the people over on so-and-so street because they have no clue what they're doing. I don't even go there no more. <laughs> and they want to start calling out people's names to me. You know how they think you all work for the same place, you know, and you all know everybody? Well, perceptions are a funny thing. I tell you, perceptions are a funny thing. You know, there's a neat little phrase about perceptions that's key. It says, with perceptions, it's not what you say, but what is heard. It is not what you show, but what is seen. It is not what you mean, but what is understood. Perception is what? Reality. Is that a fact? That's a fact. Take a look at the screen where you have a little box right there that says, you'll see it there, but there's a little box right there in front of you that says, the, a bird in the, look right down, see where you see it? A bird in the, it starts with that. Everybody together, please read for me what that says. A bird in the hand is worthless. One more time, a little louder, please. One more time, please. A bird in the hand is worthless. A bird in the hand is worthless. Wow, that's so deep and shallow, isn't it? What in the world does that mean? Well, believe it or not, it's not in there because it means anything. It's, we have it in there because that's not what it says. Look at it again. It says a bird in the, the hand is worthless. And that's something about perceptions. How long does it take a perception to set in, folks? Boom. That one took about four seconds. How long can it take to change one? It can take a long time sometimes, especially as long as it's been there. But what do you think in terms of, if I say that changing perceptions is easier if you know what the perceptions are, does that make sense? What do you think? Because you have a CSI, a customer satisfaction index nowadays, that gives you some feedback on what exactly uh, customer perceptions are and what they're all about and what they see. And it's, you think it's easier to change one if you know what it's all about and know what customers are being asked about and how they're responding. What do you think? Is it easier to change something you know about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I tell you what, when we talk about that, it's important for you to know that over the course of this entire program, managing customer perceptions is, perceptions is a big part of that. And I want you to know that that is this segment on customer perceptions. Thank you very much. talk to you a moment or two about something that uh, is kind of interesting from a customer point of view and it has to do with the image of the Postal Service and before we talk image image I want to tell you that it is uh, an interesting thing trying to learn about the Postal Service because we got to know you first before we come speak to you and I because people told us if you're gonna talk to postal people you better know something about the post office before you go out there you know how you all because you get up and leave won't you if people don't know what they're talking about well they told me to do the homework, so I did the homework. And let me tell you, I know the difference between certified mail and registered mail. I know about express mail and waiver of signature and no weekend delivery option. I know all about the difference between special handling and special delivery. I know what, restri what restricted delivery is. I know about return receipt for merchandise. Frankly, you got to know. I know about classification reform. I know that next year, this time, second class mail won't be called second class mail. It'll be called periodicals, a publication service. The sortation methods will be different. You won't have the alphabet soup anymore. You know, uh, the uh, this whole third class thing won't be third class. It'll be standard standard mail, sortation prices, you won't be doing the shake half trade deal, it'll be piece count, no zip plus four discounts. I learned all this stuff. I frankly have Pub 201 memorized, but it's still not enough for you all. Because you know, when you're dealing with postal people, you have to know what a 4314C is, don't you? Because that's a different level. The language, the language, the 4314C, consumer service card, I know everybody that works with a customer in the Postal Service knows what the 4314C is, and I can test it anywhere I go. I go out to some place, and I'll say, uh, go right up to the counter and say, can I have a 4314C? I get this response all over the country. Why? <laughs> and when they say that, I look right at them and say, now I need two. <laughs> Shakes them up a little bit. They say, you from headquarters? I know I'm not from... 
Well, I had to learn about this language of the Postal Service, and there's definitely a language. I want to show you what it's like for somebody who does not know about you to go through this. Now, my next door neighbor, Sherry, had been working for the Postal Service for about 20 years, you know, a short timer. Now, I asked Sherry, <laughs> Sherry, what should I do if I want to really learn about the post office? She said, no problem. Go down to GMF. I said, pardon me? She said, GMF. Because you know how you get a little saucy with people when they don't understand? <laughs> I said, I don't know what the GMF She said, there's no mail facility right down the street. I said, all right, all right, all right. I went down there because, you know, by the way, how many of you have ever been to or worked at the GMF or plant in PNDC before? Raise your hands. I tell you, if you raise your hands, I know something about you. You don't complain about mail processing. The people who have not been complain about mail processing every day. It's because you're not seeing what goes on down there. Let me tell you, when I went down to the GMF and I saw a piece of mail get from that side of the building to that side of the building, first thought that hit me was, <laughs> do what you can. <laughs> That's the first thing that hit me. Do what you can. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Well, you know when you go down to the plant, PNDC, the GMF, whatever you want to call it this week, you go on the automation tour. You know what the automation tour is. You know you got to go most cost to least cost. They got to show you how that process works. Well, they take you over there first and show you, you know, where people handle the mail by hand. Then they show you the LSMs, right? Then you get over here and you see the OCRs, and now you got MLOCRs, and over here you got the BCSs, and now you don't have just BCSs, but DBCSs and RBCSs and CSBCSs because of <laughs> DPS, and I thought, <laughs> after about 30 minutes of this, I realized I was WAC. <laughs> That means without a clue. I had no idea what these people were saying to me. So I went, sat down in that little break area. You know the break area at the plant where people play cards, you know, they talk, they sleep. A lot of sleep goes on. You know, late at night, a lot of sleep goes on in the break area. Well, here came a postal angel. And postal angels always arrive in my greatest time of need. And just so you know who they are, they're real people. They are people that have three days left before they retire. You know what I'm talking about? The people that don't get bent out of shape, that kind of smooth things over. My postal angel came up and she said, young man, you're trying to learn about the post office, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> I said, OK, well, where should I go? She said, the station. I said, pardon me? She said, the station. Because you know how you all get when people don't understand your little language. I said, well, and I'm trying to play this off. So I said, which station would you go to if you were me? She said, a 20. <laughs> I said, pardon me? She said, level 20. And it dawns on me that you all believe these numbers are actually written on the building, don't you? You don't know that we don't see <laughs> Nobody cares about this stuff but you all. How many of you work at a branch or station? Probably a lot of you. A lot of you answer the phone like this. So-and-so branch, so-and-so station. Have no idea why you do that. Because every time you do it, a customer says this. Is this the post office? <laughs> just say it's the post office. You follow me? <laughs> we don't know there's more than one anyway. We just know the one we go to. Well, I went down to the, there was a station down the street. So I went down the street, and there was a lady right there at the window. And I'm trying to find out what's going on. I said, OK, man, I want to learn about what you do. Tell me what you do. She said, no problem. Used to be a PTF, and I'm a T6 now. I said, all right, man. You go on with your bad self, that old PTF stuff. What's that? I had no idea what this woman was saying. Then she said this to me, very interesting. She said, Greg, if you really want to get in good with postal people, ask them when they became regular. I said, pardon me? No, wait, 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 wait. wait. I said, ask, ask them what now? She said, ask them when they became regular. That's a very important day for us. I said, it's important for a lot of people, but that's not really. So she wasn't understanding what I was trying to find. I went down the way. Another lady working right at the same counter. I said, OK, man, I want to learn what you do, but don't, don't run that T6 thing on me. Don't try that, because I've been there. I've done that. She said, I would never say that. I said, what do you do? She said, 204B. I said, all right, then. Go on with your bad self. That's even more numbers than the T6, man. <laughs> And then she said this. She said, you know what? I've been 204 being at this station for three years. Now, that is not a word. You cannot make a verb out of this. I've been 204 being at this station for three years. And it dawns on me that many of you have not even come to the conclusion that you've never seen a 204A, have you? There's no such thing. See, the rest of the country, we start at the beginning of the alphabet. We kind of move that way. Well, the 204B and the T6 took me over to the DMM and the IMM. There's a lot of good information in the DMM and IMM, right? And many of you know that a lot of the BMEUs have the DMM and IMM on CDROM because of all the different classes of mail. Well, customer came in, a 204B went to go help the customer. Well, M popped the PMR from the AO, took me and the T6 over to the IRT. We checked out the PVI. Now, we got over there where the stuff was going. And it dawned on me that this is what you all were going to do the whole time I was there. I got scared. I left. I just left. I said, see you. But I came back with something that prepared me. I came back with Pub 32. Now, I don't know if you know what Pub 32 is or not, but Pub 32 is the glossary of postal terms. 
I've got it now. By the way, I've got the most recent edition. It was updated April 1988. Okay, do you have that one? Do you have that one? Tony Frank is still the postmaster general. <laughs> but now I've got a little confidence, so I'll come out now, and I'll come out and visit, and I've got some confidence. I'll come out, and I'll say, okay, thanks for having me out at the AO. <laughs> Oh, before we get started, could you show me where the J-O-H-N is in this facility, please? <laughs> and you know, you got to go to a lot of AOs. Guess what? There is no J-O-H-N. You know what I mean? I can understand these people are having a bad attitude, can't you? <laughs> you know, there are post offices in this nation where there's a key hanging on the wall, ladies and gentlemen. A key hanging on the wall. And that key is to a next-door neighbor's house. <laughs> now, if you know I'm not lying about that, raise your hand so you know I'm not. There are hundreds of post offices where they go into someone's home to use the bathroom any time of day they want to and just lock the door and come back out. <laughs> Boy, I think we need to do some work on facilities, but let's move on. <laughs> when I started working with postal people, they said this to me. They said, Greg, when you work with us, you get to use postal forms. That's how they said it. You could use postal forms. I said, oh, oh joy. <laughs> well, what do you mean? They said, well, if you travel less than 50 miles, you're using 1164. I said, okay. What if I travel uh, over 50 miles? They said, it's a 1012. I said, but that's a smaller number. They said, yeah, we know. And they didn't even flinch. They just looked at me right there. I'm like, what are you all doing? Rolling dice back there going. 1510, let's stick with it. That's three dice, by the way. Does some of this language sneak out to customers? Sure it does, especially if it's the end of the day, you're tired. You know, a customer will come in and say, you know, I'm moving. You say, well, you need to fill out a COA. Customer goes, okay. They don't know what you're talking about. They just don't. But image is also driven by a lot of things, because image is what helps people to de develop a trust of a business. Now, I tell you, let's talk about a couple of things that help develop an image that's positive and that will generate more money for you. Now, number one, is attire important? Is your attire important, the way you dress? Is it important? Absolutely. I tell you, when people come into a post office, they want to see employees that want the customer's money, not that need the customer's money. Are you following this a different realm? Yeah. <laughs> And I want to know, I know people are sensitive about this, and I want you to know I'm sensitive because the first time I brought up the whole thing, you know, the uniform thing, the first time I brought it up, I was in a place that was not as, not as friendly as you all are. And the guy told me this. Right when I started talking about uniforms, he said, let me tell you something. <laughs> they give me money for a uniform, then I'll wear a uniform. Okay, but until then, I'm wearing what I want to wear. Understand that? <laughs> and I said, okay. Well, you know, and I backed up because I didn't know. I didn't know how the thing, you know. Then I went back to what was my full-time job at the time. I worked for a long-distance company in customer service. 400 people never saw a customer. We never saw a customer. Guess how we had to dress every day, ladies and gentlemen? Suit and tie. Ladies in business dress every day. Now, guess how much extra money we were paid to dress that way? None. Guess how much less money most of us made than you? Much! I checked. <laughs> So when you use that one as an argument, be very careful who you're taking that to. Attire. Now, I got to go a little further because there's toes here that I've not gotten to. So let me, let me do this. Uh, about the uniforms. Now, guys, I like, the, I like those shirts. I like those shirts. You know, the little stripe. That, that gives continuity. But I tell you, gentlemen, if you're going to wear those shirts, let's iron those shirts. Now, let's start with that. And I don't mean to get mean with you, but be, and before you iron them, let's uh, wash them, someone said. Absolutely wash it. The shirts are not good for three days, are they, ladies? You, gotta, you can't just pop them in the dryer and put bounce in there and they come out with a spring scent. That's not going to work. You know? I got three or four toes left. Let me go. Oh, by the way, gentlemen, if you're going to wear a tie, it's important. I want, from a customer to you, it's important. If you're going to wear a tie, to wear it all the way up or not at all. Never have a customer see you with your tie halfway down because how do you deliver my mail now? Halfway. Customers bring that kind of thing. But ladies, you were enjoying that, weren't you? Let me talk to y'all for a minute. <laughs> ladies, I love the little things y'all got, especially the little ascot things. Those are cool, the little ascot things. Aren't those cool? I like that. Look, very neat, very professional. But ladies, you have to make sure you dress more than just waist up, especially in the summertime. You know, walk off from the counter with Daisy Dukes all up here. You know, <laughs> Well, it's hot, they should turn on the air. All this kind of stuff will not work. You gotta be. I <laughs> think I covered everybody now. Let's move on to greeting. Now, what is that greeting that many of you don't use anymore with customers? You don't even use it anymore. It's one word, you don't say it that oh, Say it. One word, starts with an N. Next. Next, that's the one you don't use anymore. Listen to the love, the humility, the warmth, the sense of belonging that comes when you hear that word. Next! Did you feel that? <laughs> You know why people don't like that? It's because it sounds like this. Sit! 
It's not a greeting, it's a command. I almost named my daughter next so she'd be first all the time. Give you, got that one? Okay, good, all right, all right. Let's talk about eye contact for a second. Eye contact, is it important? Eye contact, say yes, please. Yeah. It says some things are happening. It says I'm listening, it says I'm conveying, I'm paying attention. It also says you can believe what I'm saying, but you know, eye contact does drop off sometimes at the post office, doesn't it? Sometimes, you know, have you ever heard people tell the joke about postal time, like a postal 10 minutes or 20 minutes? You heard that kind of stuff before? Well, postal time, I found out, does not always expand. Sometimes postal time contracts, like especially that last 60 seconds at the end of the day. You know what I'm talking about? Is that the truest 60 seconds on the face of the earth or what? That's nuclear time, isn't it, that last 60 seconds? Now, what's interesting is, it seems always, and you have told us this, in that last 60 seconds, a car always pulls up. Have you noticed that? The last 60 seconds. Now, the closer it gets to that 60 seconds, more heads get lower and lower, because you don't want to make it, you don't want to encourage anything. So, but the last 60 seconds, a car pulls up, and it's like the chariots of fire theme goes off in post offices across the nation. You know the chariots of fire theme. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Throw me the keys! <laughs> And y'all will lock that door and high five each other. That's right, baby. We got to lock that door. We're going home tonight, I tell you what. And what is it with those Venetian blinds? Because a lot of you got the little Venetian blinds. Y'all will roll those real fast. And if you're going to close the blinds and you're closed, don't look back through the blinds. I, you all do this all the There's eight of them. <laughs> do you know we can hear y'all laughing at us out there? Eye contact is important. Attitude is attitude important. Is there some situations out there where postal customers like to believe that postal people as a whole have bad attitudes? You think that? They think that a lot of you don't smile, don't want to be around people. I don't know where they get this from, but yes, I do know where it comes from. It comes from the fact that you have some people working around you sometimes that are always sending this message out, right? Like, I got a job by birthright, that kind of feel. Have you seen that kind of thing before? I want you to picture somebody for a second. I want you to picture the most negative postal employee you've ever worked with cannot say anything positive about anything, anytime, anybody, anywhere, anytime. Anyway, it's just toxin just flowed out of their mouth. <laughs> acid, acid all the time. Now, can you picture that person? Now, before we go any further, let me tell you, stop trying to get me involved in stuff because some of you are out there doing this. <laughs> I'm not getting into this. <laughs> but you know, these people, if they survive long enough, tend to have an effect on you too, don't they? They start dragging you down to them. Without knowing it, your smile starts going away. And people have to call it to your attention. Have you ever had a customer call it to your attention? What's wrong with it? Oh, nothing. You don't even know what your face is conveying. And I tell you, it's hard to put up with that because a lot of you have to put up with it every day. As a matter of fact, some of you even thought you were going to, how many of you tried to change an office to go where that person was not there? Who was waiting for you when you got there? Another one just like the other one. Am I right? I talked to a lady once who said, Mr. Gray, that's not a problem for me. I said, how is it not a problem for you and it's a problem for so many others? She said, I choose for it not to be a problem for me. Isn't that an interesting answer? She said, I choose not to deal with that. I said, how do you do that? She said, Mr. Gray, let me tell you something. These people that are trying to get on my nerves every day, they're going to be here every day. I can't be bothered with that because if they, I get bothered with that, they start bothering me, then the people who I cannot necessarily guarantee coming in every day will stop coming in. And guess who she was talking about? Customers. What a thought. Then you got lobby environment. The environment of your lobby is critical. And I tell you, it's important to know that all these things you're doing as a post office are great. You got post office expresses showing up in Walmarts and Kmarts where you're almost doing pack and send type stuff. You got the lobby renewal program, which many of you are thrilled about because many of you know the only reason you're in that particular building is because it's the lowest lease the post office could get that day. You know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> then you got postal stores where customers can do something they've never done before, shop for products. Well, they were shopping before, but they were driving you crazy. What else you got? What else you got? What's he got? Can you get what he's got over here? Because I have to go over there. Have you been through this? Especially when it's a one stamp. I tell you, it says something about your industry that you're trying to look more like a, some, a business with continuity. I can go into one post office and look in another one, and while some of the things are different because the personalities of post offices are different, I can now know I'm in a post office. But it's not just the big stuff, sometimes the little stuff, like the piece of paper that sits on the floor. Now, I tell you, many of you have heard something like this before, and it drove you crazy, and I can appreciate it. Some of you have heard somebody say this to you. That piece of paper's been on the floor for three days. Now, what is wrong with that statement fundamentally? You know what it is. If you know it's been on the floor for three days, that means what? You didn't pick it up, but you want to bring it to my attention to pick it up. 
you got to pick up the paper. It's important because customers see that and they draw conclusions. The table where all the supplies are. It's important to make sure this stock. Give that to a perfectionist to take care of. They'll make sure that's taken care of. By the way, behind the counter, those of you who are window clerks, that area where you work, customers look at that and they draw some conclusions about stuff. If that area is in complete state of disarray, you know what they'll say? They'll say something just like this. You know, this is just like 67 when you lost my check. <laughs> and y'all would go, 67? <laughs> Sir, I was not even here in 67. <laughs> but that guy over here, he was here. Let me go get him. I'll be a Harry. Because you know y'all will go get somebody at the post office, won't you? <laughs> is image important to the U.S. Postal Service? Absolutely. You make it over every single day. And I want you to know that every time you speak, you represent everybody that has a postal badge. It's that important. Customers want your image to be great. And if you make it great, I'll keep you in business and make you happy, too. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.